Mais ça, j'ai... I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the theme of our CME, Dilemmas in Clinical Practice, Present and Future. Today, we have a set of eminent speakers with us to enlighten us uh, on some fascinating topics in keeping with the theme, Dilemmas in Clinical Practice, Present and Future. I expect all of you would relish the upcoming sessions and it would definitely be an add-on to you all. The inaugural ceremony will begin shortly. I humbly invite on dais our Honorable Principal, Came City Medical mm -hmm. College, Dr. Lethi Nair, ma'am, onto the stage. Thank you, ma'am. Now I would like to invite a dignified senior professor of psychiatry, former IPS state and uh, South Zone president, founder, secretary of Calicut Psychiatry Guild, Dr. V. V. Mohan Chandran Saw, onto the dais. Thank you, sir. Uh, as a COO, Dr. Ramiz is unable to attend the function due to some. <laughs> President Calicut uh, Psychiatry Guild, Dr. Mohan Sundaram Sir, onto the stage. Thank you, sir. I humbly invite on onto the dais our esteemed head of the department, of Psychiatry, KMCT Medical College, and the organizing chairman, cha chairman of the CME, Dr. Sushil Kakin Sir. Thank you, sir. Next, I would like to invite our brilliant professor, Department of Psychiatry, KMCT Medical College, and the head of the scientific committee of the CME, Dr. Raj Mohan Saw, to grace the dice. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to invite on dice our dynamic assistant professor, Department of Psychiatry, KMCT Medical College, and the organizing secretary of the CME, Dr. Zoyev Raj Saw. Thank you, sir. I humbly request all of you to rise for a two minutes prayer. Yai malaril mana mai alakadalil ayadamai akniil te. Hari binu ravidam mana silvignana mai paramapadam hana yu work moksha mayanum. Hari vai niravai niramai nirayuna paramatma niradeva nada me deva me andhakaratinde agnana varamilla. Vindu poi iduvan veli cham thudi kyuvan karma chaitanyam sira kali pulkuvan nirmala jyoti se kai thorunni. Thank you. Now uh, I humbly request Dr. Sushil Kakin sir to address the crowd.
Good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to our uh, KMCT campus. My, uh, I'm here to welcome all of you for today's program. Uh, respected Principal, Professor Leti Nair, Guest of Honor, Professor V.V. Mohan Chandran, President of Calicut Psychiatry Guild, Dr. Mohan Sundaram, uh, Professor of Psychiatry, Dr. Raj Mohan, Dr. Sohab Raj, faculties, dignitaries on and off the dais, and uh, distinguished delegates. To inaugurate the CME, we have our beloved principal, uh, Professor Leti Nair here. Due to a series of CMEs, Madam has not been able to take a day off recently. Even today, Madam has a couple of other programs. Madam has been a source of encouragement and support to us throughout. With utmost respect and great appreciation on behalf of the organizing committee and on my own personal behalf, I extend a hearty welcome to you, Madam. Today's guest of honor is Professor V. V. Mohan Chandra, sir. Sir is an integral part of every psychiatric program in Calicut. He is loved and respected by everyone here. On behalf of the organizing committee, I extend a warm welcome to you, sir. <laughs> Dr. Mohan Sundaram is the president of Calicut Psychiatric Guild, a very efficient leader, a meticulous person, active in many organizations, who gives a personal touch to everything he does. He had absolutely no hesitation in keeping this Sunday free for us. A very, very warm welcome to you, sir. Our dynamic COO, Dr. Ramis, has supported us throughout. He, he was always available to sort out various practical issues pertinent to the smooth conduct of the program. Because of a, uh, an official preoccupation, he's out of station and he could not be here in person. In his absence, I welcome him for the program. As you would guess, the entire scientific session were conceived and formulated by Dr. Raj Mohan. It's my duty to welcome Dr. Raj Mohan to the CME. <laughs> Dr. Soyab Raj, the organizing secretary, has been doing the bulk of running around. Uh, he, he's the kind of uh, colleague any HOD would love to have. When it comes to organizing a program, he's in a zone of his zone. As the chairman of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome Dr. Soyab Raj. I would like to place on record the encouragement and support our department has been receiving from our chairman, Dr. K. Moidu, CEO and management trustee, Dr. K. M. Navas, and head operations, Dr. Aisha Nasri. I would like to welcome all the faculties for today's program. Dr. Jitu VP, Associate Professor of Psychiatry, Manjeri Medical College. Dr. Varsha Vidyadharan, Assistant Professor, Calicut Medical College. Dr. Raj Mohan, Dr. Ruttik, Mr. Pranav Raj, all from KMCT Medical College. In particular, I would like to uh, mention Dr. Anil Kakunchi, Professor at HOD's uh, Enapoya Medical College. Actually, he gave me a positive uh, uh, mail reply in less than 15 minutes. It's much appreciated. Hearty welcome to Dr. Anil in his absence. Dr. Sevin Kumar, Associate Professor of Psychiatry, Trichur Medical College, has come all the way from Trichur to grace the occasion. Welcome to Dr. Sevin. No program is a success without good attendance. We have academicians, consultants, and PGs here. I welcome all of you to today's program. I realize many more are the who are associated with today's CME. My colleagues in the department, especially Dr. Ruttik, has been running around for quite, few, few, quite, for quite some time over the last few days. Staff of our, our institution, I welcome all of you uh, to today's CME. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request Dr. Lati Nair, ma'am, to formally inaugurate the event. Good morning, all of you. 
uh, I am extremely happy to be here for inaugurating the CME organized by the psychiatry department. I also appreciate the efforts taken for organizing the CME. And the topics uh, in the CME is all very interesting and useful. Uh, and I wish uh, students had participated, especially the program workshop on stress management. I find that students off late, uh, parents particularly, complain to me. Uh, no, they tell me that students are in stress. Uh, they find it difficult to cope with the present uh, curriculum. The curriculum has changed, as you all know, since 2019. It is competency-based. And probably they might take some time to get used to the present curriculum. So they have... Uh, some stress and uh, I wish uh, they had participated. Uh, Dr. Sushil and Dr. Raj Mohan, when they met me, they said that they will take a class for them, for students, uh, probably in batches as to how to cope up with the new system. Now, mm, mm, so uh, I welcome all uh, the participants for the CME and I'm sure the speakers with their vast experience will give a uh, large uh, will give inputs to the uh, program so i formally inaugurate the cme and wish the cme all success thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am now, I humbly invite Dr. Mohan Sundaram Saw for the presidential address. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Lati Nair, Principal, KM City Medical College, Dr. V. V. Mohan Chandran, former professor and head of the department in a medical college, and our own founder, past president, and guide of Calicut Psychiatric Guild, Dr. Sushil, professor, psychiatric KM City Medical College, Dr. Raj Mohan, Professor KM City Medical College, Dr. Soheb Raj, Assistant Professor KM City Medical College, our own uh, Guild uh, active members, doctors, teachers, and students, and all the invitees who have come here to take part in this uh, CME program. I congratulate the KM City Medical College Psychiatry Department for organizing this one day CME and workshop on a very, very important as well as a misunderstood area like dilemmas in psychiatry and clinical practice. Psychiatry was a dilemma in the past century and before. Like, actually, you know, like psychiatry graded down from mythology to philosophy, theories, and now a well understood scientific faculty in medicine. We all know that uh, of modern medicine, psychiatry is the modernest of modern medicine. Because in the second half of the last century, it has uh, advanced extensively compared to the other faculties, uh, mainly, the, mainly the areas of uh, understanding the illness as well as uh, a ease of uh, management, which has been due to, I would say, the understanding of the illness. Now, the various... Uh, Important areas where psychiatry is advanced, I would say, is on his uh, 
the understanding of the illness like this the classificator system which had come in in the last uh, century by both the WHO as well as the American Diagnostic Association of Psychiatry, the DSM and the ICD. That has improved the clinical assessment and the astute understanding of the illness to that extent that uh, even a general practitioner or a, or a medical house surgeon in a casualty can easily sort of identify ailments of mental health from the other illnesses. And uh, it helps us a lot because uh, you know that uh, when you come take a group of patients attending a general practitioner's clinic as well as a outpatient in the tertiary referral system as a, of a medical college outpatient, it is understood that 70% of the patients attending the clinic or the outpatient in a tertiary hospital suffer from emotional disorders and mental ailments and only 30% suffer from genuine physical illnesses, which has been proved. The second area which is uh, advanced is uh, psychopharmacology. Like even I would say, like when I was a postgraduate in the 80s, like uh, our psychopharmacology book by Stephen Stahl was only a meager of 200 pages. And now the Stephen Stahl psychopharmacology book goes up to more than 1,000 pages. And the number of drugs, when we were students, it was only 20. Now it has gone up to more than 800. So, you know, like, uh, what has been the advancement in psychopharmacology, which has once again eased the treatment of patients, like from mental hospital psychiatry, from tying down to general hospital psychiatry, and even managing sick patients in a general clinic, in a clinical setting. Now, third development is uh, understanding of psychotherapy in a scientific way, which has stressed the importance of uh, psychological methods of treatment apart from the physical methods in uh, managing emotional disorders. So psychiatry has uh, traveled extensively in the last few decades. And uh, as I told you, now it has become a, an important faculty of uh, Medicine, I would say there is no ward or uh, outpatient where a psychiatrist is not sought for help in case of uh, a distressed patient or a disturbed patient. Now, the list of speakers, like you all know, are uh, very versatile, well, well uh, learned teachers who are addressing you on the various topics which has been brought out by the KMCT department. I wish you all uh, a great learning and uh, an academic recipe. And I thank once again the Department of Psychiatry headed by Dr. Sushil for uh, associating Calicut Psychiatry Guild in this meeting as well as uh, inviting me to address this function. So thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request uh, Dr. Mohan Sundaram sir to honor our chief guest, Dr. I request Dr. Mohan Sundaram sir to honor our chief guest, Dr. V. V. Mohan Chandran sir. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. V. V. Mohan Chandran, sir, to address the audience. Good morning, everybody. 
respected principal Dr. Leti Nair, president of the Calicut Psychiatric Guild, uh, Dr. Mohan Sundaram, the main organizers of this meet, Professor Sushil, Dr. Soheb, Dr. Raj Mohan, and my colleagues in psychiatry and friends. Let me at the very outset thank uh, Professor Sushil and Soeb for uh, having invited me for this function as the guest of honor. In fact, um, I really enjoyed uh, reading the title of this today's academic program, Dilemma. What is meant by dilemma? Dilemma is a very unusual circumstance when a professional is demanded or needed to choose between one or more, two or more alternatives, which of course are all undesirable. That is the meaning of a dilemma. And even today, in spite of traversing for such a long decades in psychiatry, we know the dilemma persists. For example, take for instance bipolar disorder. Except the name has changed. In our times in the 70s, we used to call it manic depressive psychosis. Before that, it is used to be manic depressive insanity. What things have changed, I'm sure, keen to listen to Professor Sabin Kumar in bipolar disorder, except that the name has changed. And the DSM, which of course um, my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Mohan Sundaram referred, has uh, an inept attitude or system to keep on changing the names. What is there in the name? Whether we call it manic depressive psychosis or bipolar disorder, it is one of the same. The only differences I still remember in the 70s when lithium came in our circle, our excitement. I don't know how many of how my professional present colleagues share this excitement, but I still have that excitement because there is yet no substitute for lithium. And I still remember my great teacher referring as is one of the three wonders in medicine. The first wonder he used to say is antibiosis. The second is rehydration therapy, and the third is lithium. Lithium was the great answer, not even chlorpromacin, because uh, lithium just revolutionized the whole concept of psychiatry. Because um, initially, everything used to be psychosis, neurosis, whatever name you call. But then, when lithium came into the market in our, for our use, we were forced, here there's a drug which tells you, you must revise your diagnostic pattern. Because what now you used to call as affective disorder, there used to be two classifications, schizophrenia and affective disorder. And you must make a positive effort to make a diagnosis of affective disorder so that you can use lithium. Of course, now people say rapid cycling, they challenge lithium, lithium gets revisited, lithium gets no visit, whatever. Um, even today to my colleagues in psychiatry, uh, I still use, I'm a fan of lithium even today, I still continue to use lithium. Perhaps the only effort you have to do is to, you have to persuade your um, um, patient and the relatives to make periodic blood checking. And they do agree. Because in, in psychiatry, the problem is we do not have much blood uh, investigative procedures. People, of course, now since CT scan, MRI have come, we have a couple of that. But uh, old timers like me are not so fanciful unless it is <laughs> indicated I don't go for CT scan. I remember years ago when the first CT scan, Fatima Hospital introduced, people used to ask, sir, what is CT scan venom? So I used to tell Abdullah is much richer uh, uh, not to get replenished by your money. You better keep it in your purse. 
and they used to understand that and, uh, maybe a bit, bit, bit frustration on their part because they expect that. But then, uh, after uh, lithium, we have one uh, periodic serum lithium estimation. I still remember, I enjoy, uh, but now I'm not very sure. We have to be really, really careful about serum lithium estimation. I remember the great teacher who used to draw blood himself from the day one. Uh, Jubilee Madam's husband, our biochemist <laughs> professor, great teacher. Um, um, uh, sometimes when we may, we don't instruct uh, the patient to, I've told, told us, he specifically asked, then you asked us, which, who is the doctor? Did he advise you? I mean, such a meticulous person, I still remember the first time I have to go and meet him. Such a respectful person, he was like, um, after that I'm not very sure with the serum lithium level uh, to repeat, but um, for uh, official reasons, or from a litigant's point of view, we have to get it uh, periodically estimated. So having said that, um, psychiatry is one branch, uh, as Mohan Sundaram has rightly mentioned, to keep on changing a lot of drugs. When I in entered, there was only a dozen drugs, not even a dozen drugs we have to keep, uh, must be 10, 10 less than 10. Now there are innumerable drugs which we can't keep track. It comes and goes. Something comes and disappears. But there are certain things like chlorpromazine, uh, lithium, which still stays. Um, we start, uh, and that way, this uh, continuing medical education program is essential. Uh, not just that uh, uh, medical council insists that you have to attend, uh, you have to occur. Apart from that, uh, it is very important, and uh, I must congratulate the organizers. Um, I hear uh, Sushil mentioning Raj Mohan's name um, for. Um, but I had, I, if I were um, asked, I would have suggested one topic, that is um, ethics in psychiatry. That's extremely important. See, for example, there was a time when we did not realize that our patients did not have capacity. They, patients did not have autonomy. People never bothered whether they had capacity or autonomy. And now it is extremely important. Uh, people used to think that uh, our patients, psychiatry patients, psychotics, they don't re understand. But remember, youngsters, they are very perceptive. Every movement, every word from my own personal experience. I still recall one instance, and I would stop at that. I would not uh, make it more lengthy. Um, one day, uh, years ago, it was in, in the early 80s, uh, I remember, you know, those, those are the days when we were waiting for patients. I remember my teacher saying that initially we wait for patients, then patients wait for you, and the patients run after. This is our own medicine professor, my great, uh, he's no more, Professor M. V. Chari used to say. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I remember recently when I met um, uh, Professor B. M. Hegde, my great teacher, he asked me which phase were, are you, Mohan? Um, I said, um, I was stopped, uh, sir, everything. <laughs> Slowly uh, walking back uh, the road. So what, hap what that time happened was like, um, uh, people used to just take it for granted that psychiatric patients, they, I mean, they won't understand anything. Like I remember I was waiting, my wife was very impatient. We wanted to go for a movie. And uh, uh, the patient was taking a long time. We have to keep on uh, listening, listening, listening. And underneath the, uh, underneath the table, I just looked at the watch. And after some time, uh, my patient says, sir, you are in a hurry. I said, no, 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 you carry on, don't worry. I am not in a hurry. No, sir, I, I noticed that you have been looking at the watch. See, they are so very perceptive. I just gave this example, my experience in the 80s. They are so very perceptive. You have to be very careful. Your facial expression, your uh, uh, non-verbal interaction, your body movement, body language, they were very perceptive about everything. So you shouldn't just ignore the, oh, they are patients, then take it for granted. That is the only one thing. And um, 
Why ethics means uh, we have to value the individual, the patient as an individual. It's not a patient. And remember, uh, ours is a branch uh, which involves several uh, uh, professionals which have totally different orientation. See, for example, uh, psychological orientation, social orientation, anthropological orientation. They would say human orientation because some people consider psychiatrists not, not very human or humane. <laughs> and uh, they say that uh, because we have we have resort to inhuman treatment like ECT. But even today, if somebody asks me, I was very fond of asking this question. I don't know whether I asked this question to you, Vasu. Uh, what is the sure antidepressant for MD exam? The answer I expect is ECT. None of the antidepressants. Even today, the latest is uh, Vortioxetine. Yeah, even that, not a sure antidepressant. The sure, the surest antidepressant is ECT. But still, people consider it as a, a very primitive method, crude method. But they won't consider uh, using electricity in the, by the cardiologist. Well, but psychiatrists, you see. Fine, I mean, that is the way of the... Uh, <laughs> way of the... Uh, uh, world or way of the professional circle because they can't tolerate any, anybody. Perhaps uh, one thing which, which should be a, a point of satiation for all of us is that ours is the only branch who could walk to any department. You c gynecologists can't go to uh, pediatrics department, pediatrician can't go to medicine department, but psychiatrist is one of the most wanted not wanted criminal, but um, uh, <laughs> wanted professional, medical professional, who could walk into any department. Uh, before they used to say radiology, even radiology now, we use MRI. Uh, we, we can think of even, which is not available in Calic respect, and things like that, uh, uh, functional uh, radiological methods and so on and so forth. So I must uh, congratulate for choosing this topic dilemma and um, I must once again express my thanks uh, to all of you and, uh, and also I remember this is the second time I'm coming and meeting uh, uh, our uh, erstwhile colleague uh, Dr. Leti Nair. Thanks to my friend uh, Sushi, Professor Sushi. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for your patient hearing and thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Now I would request Dr. Zoheb Raj, sir, to offer the vote of thanks. Good morning, uh, respected dignitaries, on and off the dais. Again, uh, ever since, I mean, I know that you're all actually waiting for the uh, academic fees that uh, this is going to actually after the sense. But again, I would like to actually, uh, once the program was actually conceived, and until this point where it is being executed, uh, our, our primary patron as well as our principal, Dr. Ladi Nair, has been actually supportive all through. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Again, uh, uh, Augusta Fauna, uh, Dr. Uh, and Professor B.B. Mohanjandan, sir, who has been an integral part as well as who institutional, inst instituted our guild, Calical Psychiatric Guild, who is here today. Augusta Fauna, thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us. And, uh, the president of the Calicari Psychiatric Guild, uh, 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 Dr. Mohan Sundaram, who has been very supportive all through and who associated with us for organizing our program. Thank you very much, sir. And again, um, uh, the head of our department, Dr. Sushil Kakan, who has been integral as well as organizing, who conceived the whole plan of organizing a CME and actually has been always helpful all through, all, uh, ex extremely supportive, any kind, of, uh, any, any kind of effort we actually put in us because of all the support all through. Thank you, sir. And the head of the scientific committee, uh, Dr. V. Rajmohan, who, uh, who planned the whole CME, who actually got us access to all the speakers. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And now, uh, all the people have been running around, including the technical staff, as well as the drivers who are actually applying for us. And being a Sunday, I believe that you, uh, you all actually uh, need a thank you for what you have been actually going through. Thank you. 
And again, the postgraduates in our department, as well as Dr. Ruthik and Dr. Shamina, who has been uh, our SRs, who has been actually very helpful. Thank you very much. Again, now, uh, last but not the least, all the delegates who have actually assembled on this uh, Sunday, probably you could have to do better use, but then again, Academy CME, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, sir. Now, moving on to the scientific session. Now, moving on to the scientific session. Uh, in keeping with the theme, we have a first topic of the day on bipolar depression, often misunderstood and puzzling entity, especially when it comes to the management and clinical practice. First, I would uh, humbly invite uh, Dr. O. V. Vasudevan Saw, the leading senior psy consultant psychiatrist in Calicut, and Dr. Rijin Saw, consultant psychiatrist, Mental Health Center, Calicut, to chair the session. Thank you, sir. To shed light on this topic, I would invite on dais the first speaker of the day, Dr. Sebin Kumar, sir, Associate Professor of Psychiatry, Government Medical College, sir. Trishur. Uh, Sabin Kumar sir, sir did it under graduation from Government Medical College to Vandrum and then post graduation in psychiatry from CMC Vellore. is an associated editor of Kerala Journal of Psychiatry and current president of IPS Trishur. is actively involved in setting up any drug abuse clubs in various government medical colleges in Alapuri and Trishur. Sir's screen area of interest is addiction medicine. Thank you. Second. One second. This is a Kerala Medical uh, Council accredited CME, so I would request all of you to actually sign in at the counter that is just outside. Probably not right now. We have a take break. You can all sign in back then. Okay. Thank you. Good morning and uh, thank you very much for giving me a chance to chair this session. For chairing a session which is uh, for a topic which is uh, very close to my heart, bipolar depression. 
the importance the, the importance of uh, bipolar depression is that uh, uh, many of you be knowing that uh, bipolar patients up to 70 percentage of the bipolar patients uh, will be in depression in uh, if you count the cycles 70 percent of the time they have been depression rather than uh, manic phase but this uh, bipolar depression is underdiagnosed and uh, undertreated so we all will, uh, are keen to know the latest and the uh, 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 dilemmas in uh, bipolar depression from uh, Dr. Sebind Kumar. Over to Sebind Kumar. Yeah, sure. Good morning, my senior teachers, uh, colleagues, and students. Today, uh, Dr. Sebind is going to present about the dilemmas and treating bipolar depression. As are told, uh, the importance of lithium that uh, in bipolar depression, uh, psychiatry le aur kai ganda mere na na lithium. But newer generation, uh, newer generation, newer psychiatrists are not starting that uh, important drug because of uh, they are afraid of this uh, kidney problem. Uh, people are aware about this kidney problem, <laughs> so uh, they are afraid of starting this uh, lithium. But we have uh, uh, newer molecules, uh, antipsychotic with antidepressant properties uh, like uh, cariprasin, lurazidone, newer molecules are there. Then uh, we have uh, monotherapy with the uh, cutiapin and uh, lamot and mood stabilizers, lamotrigin and uh, 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 sodium valproate and carbamazepine. A lot of drugs. And, and also, diagnosis is also very uh, 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 causing dilemma because initial presentation, first presentation is depression. Uh, treating with an antidepressant is uh, uh, making problem. That is a switch uh, is a risk. Uh, and comorbid uh, uh, disorders uh, like uh, um, this uh, uh, substance use and uh, personality disorders uh, also uh, making problem in treating bipolar depression. So Sebindi is going to explain every, each and every aspect of this uh, talk, uh, topic. I invite uh, uh, Dr. Sebin to uh, deliver the speech. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I have that mic? Yeah. A very good morning to you all. Um, first of all, I extend my uh, thanks to the KMCT Psychiatry Department uh, for extending this opportunity to me. The warmth they showed, uh, Dr. Zoya picked me up from the railway station, brought me over here, showed me all the places. Uh, such a wonderful institution. And I could see the uh, camaraderie in the department with the HOD and the staff. I think the department is doing well. Thank you for uh, giving me a glimpse of this. Uh, and uh, the topic uh, is a challenging one when Dr. Rajman told me. <laughs> I told him immediately, yeah, it's a tough topic. Uh, so I'll try to do justice in my own way. Uh, for that, I am grateful for our uh, beloved psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Mohan Sundaram sir and Mohan Jindran sir both have uh, kind of set the background. What Mohan, Chandran, uh, Mohan uh, Sundaram sir said was three things. One is the classification that came, you know, from the time of Emil Kraepelin when they divided started dividing psychiatric disorders into different groups. Then from the DSM-3, 1980, where a major uh, um, could say that a paradigm shift was there in classification. The second thing that he said was psychopharmacology. Uh, Dr. Mohan Chandran sir told about lithium. And so many new molecules are coming in uh, and how they affect the brain and all. And the third thing, psycho therapy is something that we uh, don't, as psychiatrists, don't uh, give too much attention, I think, but is again a very valuable tool. Uh, and that is all these things has connection to bipolar depression. So 
because of this, I couldn't watch the match yesterday. One of the most difficult things about making the preparation was to pull myself away from the World Cup. Thankfully, um, I think Argentina won, isn't it? 2-0, so I'm not depressed. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, we know this mood, we draw this uh, chart to tell our patients, no? We have sadness, we have happiness, but then, uh, problem with bipolar is happiness or irritability getting very high and sadness getting very deep. And then there are a lot of things in between. Uh, uh, you, I have seen this comparison made with the weather. You know, you have this sunny uh, weather where a lot of uh, you feel very active. Compared to in Kerala, maybe it's a rainy season where you don't feel like going out. So, I want you to keep that in your mind. It's all introduction. Uh, I felt that generally when I interacted with people, there are two groups. That itself is a grouping thing, you no? Know? So there are people who kind of makes everything into categories. They have to organize it into different categories. But the other group uh, try to see the forest, the whole. Uh, if you look at the way ICD-11, DSM-5 is going, it's more in line with the, uh, in the lumpers who see the forest. And uh, there are some developments happening in the neurobiology which will help us understand this uh, whole uh, thing better. So that itself is a dilemma. So this is what I said which I was excited about happening uh, led by the team in US where they look at all these biomarkers or endophenotypes right from the genes, um, the you know, proteomics, uh, in the channel systems in the brain, then the in the interaction with the circuits in the brain, circuits for attention, concentration, things like that. Um, and if you look at into further, you know, subdivide them, so each part of the attribute of the brain can be divided into positive valence, negative valence, cognitive thing, social uh, thing, and all this in a context of society, where we grow, you no? Know? And uh, we have the technology to go and see what is happening inside the brain now. And uh, as psychiatric residents are here, you're in a, I think, a very exciting uh, stage of, uh, I think, medicine. Psychiatry is an integral part of medicine, where we can go in and see what is happening inside the brain using fMRI and other techniques. So we can see which circuits are getting activated. We can, uh, that technology was not there in the time of Kraepelin and all. So we have the ability to make our diagnosis better. Once the technology becomes uh, more cheaper, then we can put them in the scanners and see which circuits are getting activated. Now the, I think, uh, I think last two weeks back I was attending a online webinar where uh, I understood that to map our whole genome. You know how much it costs? It can, can be done in Kerala. It can be done in Calicut. The technology is there. It can be done with 20,000, 30,000 rupees. I can get my genome, full genome sequenced. Uh, technology is so cheap. Whereas it used to be, you know, uh, lakhs or something, maybe some years back. So technology, as it advances, maybe we can uh, take a little bit of saliva or a blood and then we can see which are the particular genes in this person or which are the, uh, you know, uh, what kind of uh, liver enzymes are there influencing the interaction with the medicines. And that will improve our treatment uh, considerably. So this is something I'm excited about. So what Mohan Chandran sir said about classification. Classification last 150 years it was based on observation and recording. I see a patient, I jot down these findings. A person comes with depression. 
I note down, okay, this is sadness is there, a lack of interest is there, I note down. So many people like you, other psychiatrists note down and we share our notes and say, we think, okay, this is depression. We don't know what is happening inside the brain. So if you can make that diagnosis more robust using maybe cognitive, you know, assess the attention concentration or do some uh, tests which can map the brain circuits and then complement with some genetic analysis or you can do some other test to influence, see which kind of neurotransmitters are being affected. That will change the way we look at psychiatry and that can be the next, you know, paradigm shift. So, I always uh, try to base my uh, thinking in terms of an evolutionary perspective. We have to keep that in mind. Not only the way our brain circuits developed, the way we behave in society, why men are generally so mad about these games like football. Isn't it generally now football? Women, gen I mean, I'm not being, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, offensive to you, but this is my experience. Generally, women might think why these guys are so mad about cricket also. In India, maybe more cricket. It's come from the evolutionary thing. Men were born hunters. We have a 30, 300 million, uh, 3 million years of being hunter-gatherers. Men used to form hunting packs. Uh, that is why we kind of, when they play football, I am like they are hunting. That gene is getting active. And that is why I feel excited. So that perspective we need to keep in mind in the context of evolution. It's only in the last 50,000 years that, you know, homo sapiens have come. And this perspective, again, I think has to be kept close to my heart, close to our hearts. Because I feel that while all these developments are happening, uh, all the talk about genetics, proteomics and all. Sometimes it has gone to the other extreme where you don't look at the human being. We don't look at the experiences that he has in his life. And we kind of think him, think him like a machine and put him uh, under all this test and see and then try to make a diagnosis. Okay, this is particular neurotransmitter. He will improve with this particular combination of neurotransmitter. I don't think so. We are human beings first. And it's not just molecules. We also are human beings, we have feelings. For that, we have to be a human being ourselves to know and understand that feeling. So that in that sense, psychiatry is a speciality that is not going to be replaced by machines. You can replace radio diagnosis with machine. Now you have technology like Watson, where you give an MRI and that will give you a printout or diagnosis. You don't need a doctor. But being a psychiatrist is also putting yourself in the other person's feet and feeling that sadness and happiness and understanding that and making it to a diagnosis, you can't do that with machines. So, you guys are in a good place, unlike many of your other specialities. See, radio diagnosis now is so sought out after. What is going to happen in 10 years, artificial intelligence is going to replace all of them. Uh, so, some clinic, clinical dilemmas, I would say, based on actual cases. Uh, this is a guy of my own age. I, I, I don't deserve to be this thing, I am not good, like crying and all. Looking at the records, I find that two, three years back she had a depressive episode, which dramatically responded within one, one week. And cross-sectionally, there was a sudden lability, a sudden crying, then she becomes normal, then she becomes irritable. So, it is not fitting in with the typical depression. So the impression that I could sense in her was whether it is a bipolar episode. And there are other issues also in her. Now this girl we've admitted uh, for more than three weeks now. Past episodes are all very clear, clear manic episodes. I've uh, talked to the psychiatrist who have admitted and treated her before, clear manic episode which has improved 100 percent. The problem we face is now her phenomena is like she will, difficult to make a rapport, doesn't make eye contact. Uh, she will just uh, sometimes come into the rounds, say hello and then go. Then stay in her bed. No over familiarity, no psycho increased activity, no grandiosity, not able to establish rapport. 
So this phenomenon is there going on for the last three weeks. So our department is divided into two groups. One group feels that this is a schizophrenia. The other group feels this is bipolar. And we are all, you know, more than 10 years experienced in this field. A similar thing I had faced during my psychiatric training in CMC, 2004 to 8. So you would have observed Mohan Jandran sir saying, Lithian uh, came into the market. So dramatic response. So in that time, this was in 2004, uh, we felt that many people were trying to make a diagnosis of schizoaffective auto schizophrenia. So some mood symptoms will be there and they will try to make a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder and justify giving a mood stabilizer. So patient will be on a mood stabilizer like lithium or valproate for a long time. And then we, uh, in our unit, decided to take them off the, uh, either, either of this. And we found that when we take them off the antipsychotic, they relapse. So there are, these are people who present with very clear mood episodes. But then they need, seem to need an antipsychotic, like a dopamine blocker. So, uh, and then not everyone also. And some people, clear mood episodes, they'll come and sometimes they'll come with only psychosis, that is, without any mood, just a negative symptom like that. So again, uh, uh, problem with this mood uh, that I have, these are all from my own personal experience. So from 450 around BC, people have observed this, they have described uh, mood from Hippocrates to uh, Ariatus. So I told about Emicraplin, the major deficient, so if you observe Kraepelin, what he focused on was the episodic nature. Episodic nature of the illness compared to dementia precox, which is a continuous illness. So actually now we look at a bipolar a spectrum, not focusing on the episodicity, but focusing on the mood. So you have mania, hypomania or depression. So that is more important for us. And uh, while the DSM, uh, uh, Mohan Sundaram sir was saying that you know, now diagnosis has become very easy. So anyone can make a diagnosis. You go through a checklist. So depression means depressed mood, anhedonia, energy, you tick click like that and depression treat. Problem is, once you've gone through a checklist kind of system, you lose the ability to see the patient as a whole. Now I've observed in my PGs where after the first year, they, for them everything is very clear. I have observed the same thing in me also. When I went into psychiatry in 2004, it was so confusing. Each patient, I used to write a long history. Uh, every day we used to come back and see the patient and then my pages will be two, three pages long, long history will be there. I have no under idea what is happening. It was so confusing. But after two years, when I passed my DPM, everything became very easy. Very simple depression, this. Uh, spot diagnosis, mania, uh, schizophrenia, everything very easy. After 10, 10 years now, things are not that easy. So as you learn more, things become more complicated. So what is happening, uh, once you start giving time to your patient and observe them uh, and try to fit in, then things are more complex. But that is more valid. If you ten, spend time like that and make a diagnosis, that is more likely to succeed than if you just go by symptom checklist. Using that, maybe it's easy to see 100 patients in my, generally in our psychiatry OPD, 150 patients, you don't get time to all this, but you have to draw a balance somewhere. So you all know the prevalence, 1% of bipolar, but it is said that bipolar spectrum, if you look at the bipolar spectrum, there are actually 2.5%. Um, and bipolar seems to be different from unipolar. Unipolar, more common in women, twice more common in women, but not bipolar. Bipolar is one is to one. And uh, uh, it's more important for young people because of the um, disability the, that it causes. They may not always suicide, but then it takes away a lot of productive years. It's a, that around 25 years, their most productive time is getting lost. So the mood spectrum, where on one end you have depression, on the other end you have uh, you know, bipolar mania, 
classic uh, type 1 bipolar with mania and depression. And uh, remember the schizoaffective patients that I said uh, before. Now recent um, evidence from genetic research has shown that when you take people with schizophrenia with bipolar, you have genes that are common. So there may be some patients whom you can't really put into either schizophrenia or bipolar. And when you take this bipolar depression, there is a lot of uh, issues with it. One of the major issues is suicidality and then there is a lack of improvement with medications um, and uh, mortality due to m many other uh, medical causes also. So it's a significant problem, bipolar depression. And the one paper I saw, you can stage into three major types of people with bipolar. One who comes with clear episodes. The other extreme, you have patients who have uh, symptoms that do not improve. The third group where, you know, they have a cognitive gradual decline along with the episodes. And there could be patients in between also. But then uh, it's not it's, uh, been easy to stage patients like this. And again, we know that when a patient comes with depression, that can be the first episode of bipolar. So how to differentiate from a unipolar depression from bipolar because that is very important. The diagnosis, the management is totally different. If you give an antidepressant to a, a bipolar depression, there is a chance of switching, rapid cycling and all that. So what all things you will look at? So this is what you look at to make, to see if it is, could be a first episode of a depression, but whether it is a bipolar depression or not. Uh, so DSM-5 and ICD-11, uh, just I want to focus on some things where the mixed episode uh, in DSM-5 is um, eliminated and uh, a manic, hypomanic or depressive episode can be specified with mixed features. And ICD-11 uh, has a mixed episode. And this paper uh, uh, tells about um, then severe, de uh, severe depression, uh, depressed mood and uh, anhedonia being made a major criteria so that if only one is there, it's not easy to diagnose as depression, oh, uh, bipolar. Uh, uh, sorry, increased energy and uh, that is what, no? Uh, increased energy and activity. So that uh, has to, both has to be there like that. So then if only one is there, they may still be put into depression. So these, the problem with this is that the uh, research will be, be based on the criteria. So if I want to do a research in psychiatry, I have to base uh, my uh, criteria on something. So if I have a criteria that um, artificially groups people into depression, then that will affect the outcome also, no? So uh, about the diagnosis, it is said that uh, in bipolar, you miss the diagnosis for a long period. Only later on, after around 10 years only, you finally end up with the diagnosis. Uh, because patients may not report their hypomanic symptoms. For them, that may not be a very disabling part. But depression would be more significant for them. Uh, so depression uh, in 40 percent of people later on uh, get diagnosed with bipolar. And again, uh, features that should, you should um, keep in mind, whether it is bipolar, uh, any nervous break breakdown or uh, psychiatric hospitalization, early onset, cyclothymic temperament, multiple episodes, uh, depression with agitation, suicidal thoughts, substance use, etc. Keep in mind whether this could be a bipolar. And uh, when you look at the total longitudinal course, the problem with depression is more compared with mania, the time spent in depression. They may not always come to you also. And morbidity, I said um, mortality and morbidity seems to be more in bipolar depression. The mood disorder questionnaire you can use to screen. So we need to be careful to ask for history of this hypomania. 
Um, and anxiety sometimes can be a marker for this bipolar. And uh, anxiety disorders, if the anxiety is there, again the illness uh, burden and outcome is also poor. Stimulant nowadays with, I think, MDMA. Previously, uh, when you take classes for MBBS students, we used to be worried about those people who sleep in the class. Because we think, you know, they uh, watch TV in the night or they take alcohol. Actually, now we have to be worried about the people who are awake. You know why? Because MDMA has become so common. So if some guy is sitting very hyper alert in your class, fully attentive, then again, uh, that is the how the situation, the reality I'm sharing with you. So stimulants have come in, which can produce this manic symptoms. Personality, again, a complicated thing. When borderline personality comes, whether it is bipolar or not, organic causes can be there. And here I would like to uh, tell about the right brain, left brain thing. So generally it is found that when you have a right brain lesion, and there is a damage to the right brain, you have a tendency to become mania. Any, any PGs here? Can you raise your hands? PGs? You're all uh, KMCT PGs. No other PGs are there. Anyone can tell why you get uh, mania when there is a right-sided damage. Uh, majority of the population are right-handed. Majority of the right-handed are right brain dominant. So uh, when there is a damage to the dominant brain, there is a risk of mania, why? And uh, the opposite, like there is a stimulation of the left brain, you can have uh, mania. Either the left brain gets stimulated or the right brain gets damaged. Anyone? Why, why, why this difference? So, uh, there is a broad difference in the way the right brain and the left brain sees the world. The right brain is a lumber. Remember I told you about lumbers and splitters. Left brain is a serial processing categorical brain, like playing chess, left brain, uh, sequential. Right brain is not like that, it is more abstract. It grabs the whole picture. So if the right brain is intact, most likely you will see the reality and you are unlikely to go develop a condition like mania, where it is a gross um, misjudgment. Okay, see, stroke, I am talking about brain damage. Patient having a brain damage, but he is fully happy, elated. It's a total uh, contrast with reality, no? That can happen only when the right brain is gone. Because the right brain gives the whole picture. There is a concept behind why the majority of the right brain uh, lesions uh, produce mania. And this is again, uh, it's like, you know, when you have a hammer, everything appears like a nail. For me, I told, now my interest is in addiction medicine and everything seems to be related to dopamine circuit for me now. So this is that dopamine reward pathway circuit. Uh, let us see why I am bringing this here. And this is three books, if anyone wants to note it down. I found very interesting. All three books are available as audio books. I hear from Audible. So these three people, that is Daniel Z. Lieberman, Judson Brewer, and Anna Lemke, all these three have their uh, TED Talks and all. They have, uh, you can Google uh, YouTube and you can get them. But the books are also available, very interesting. So, you know, it's a time of Nobel Prizes. Uh, Candle got the Nobel Prize for memory, Aplysia, sea snail. So what was the experiment, Candle? See snail, you give stimulus, a painful stimulus, it will retract, it learns. So advantage of sea snail is that it has only 20,000 neurons. A sea snail has only 20,000 neurons. So it is easy to study these neurons and Candle's uh, Nobel Prize is based on that. So uh, connecting to dopamine, you know about the dopamine neurons, I told about the reward circuit and uh, how 
uh, drugs activate this. So narcotics like amphetamine it increases dopamine by a lot of times. Like food increases dopamine by just maybe 50. But if you take amphetamine, the dopamine level increases to 1000. You can see in the graph, no? So this dopamine increase acts as a switch, triggering the reward. But then later on, uh, studies showed that this is more complicated. Don't have pointer, no? Pointer? No, no problem. So three, uh, this experiment is from monkeys where they implant uh, electrodes and see the dopamine. So monkey is given a food. There is a firing of dopamine. The, that you can see here. This grouping of blood. This is the uh, re reward. I mean, what a food or something. This is the firing of the dopamine. So monkey is getting food and the dopamine is firing. Okay, everything is understood. But then you uh, pair the food with a uh, cue. For example, you uh, switch on a red light and then give food. So red light is a cue. So this is the cue. So the monkey knows that the, when the cue is there, he will get the food. This is the reward. There is not much dopamine firing because monkey knows that. Okay. Uh, the third experiment, here there is a cue, but there is no reward. So what happens? There is decreased firing of the dopamine. The reward circuit, there is decreased firing. What it means is that it is not the drug that is firing the dopamine. It is not the drug. It is the cue. So the dopamine circuit is something for learning. Dopamine fires when there is novelty. This is the situation given in that book uh, where suppose you find a new cafeteria. You go outside, Calicut, a new uh, cafeteria opens, okay? And you go there and have this coffee and you enjoy it very much. It's the best coffee you had in your life. You decide every day you'll have this coffee. Suppose every day you come to the same cafeteria, have the coffee, after like say six months, do you think you have the same effect as the first? What is happening? It is not tolerance and all that. It is dopamine circuit not firing. Dopamine circuits fires when there is a novelty. And coming, connecting to bipolar mood and connecting to what I told about uh, the patients in CMC who seems to need antipsychotic. Uh, the, if you look at a patient with mania, what is happening? There is a lot of drive. There is increased sexual uh, this uh, drive. There is increased fam over familiarity. There is a lot of uh, motivation, a lot of confidence. It is all connected to the dopamine firing. I told, you know, uh, in the slide where you have to keep a diagnosis whether they are using amphetamine or cocaine. The same thing happens when you take cocaine. There is a lot of drive and connected to dopamine. That is the reason why dopamine blockers work in mania across the board. Even now, in my medical college, severely violent patient, why drug of choice is haloperidol? Haloperidol, because that is pure dopamine blocker and mania is a dopamine high. And this dopamine uh, circuit in some patients gets abnormal while in all of us, we need this to survive. This dopamine gives us a motivation drive. But of course, uh, for some people, it is abnormal. It fires at odd times. That is why they develop mania. And the opposite is depression. So far, so good. Pointer, USB. The USB port. This is the same thing, expected reward dopamine uh, thing. And this is Lieberman, a uh, very wonderful speaker. So he also speaks about uh, love also. Like two, three weeks back, uh, All India Radio Trishur, they called me to speak on this Pranayam Kolavadagam. That was a time Kannur, one lady got murdered. So what is why people are getting driven to kill their lover? Previously, if the uh, guy, he will go and suicide. Now he will not go in suicide, he will kill you. 
that is a trend now you can either stab or burn that what is happening so it seems this love that uh, physical that attraction seems to be related to a dopamine driven thing like hunger uh, like a cocaine withdrawal so when somebody is going through a prema nairasham it is like going through a cocaine withdrawal for that person it is like going through severe hunger and that is driving him to do it this is again not told by me it is there in this book so looking into this management generally uh, bipolar uh, management is pharmacological most important is pharmacological and uh, we should always keep in mind the suicidal risk and always review our diagnosis uh, because there is lot of uh, comorbidity coming to different guidelines the american uh, seems to go with lithium and lamotrigin as first line and they generally don't recommend a monotherapy with an antidepressant ect we know uh, next stage would be adding lamotrigin bupropion or paroxetine or an mai and if there is a psychosis they say you can add an antipsychotic the canadian uh, and uh, isbd guidelines uh, say quetiapin lorazepam lithium lamotrigin as first line so more options not just lithium whereas they put livalproate as second line this is all for bipolar depression okay the british uh, association of psychopharmacology they uh, consider quetiapin lorazepam or lansepin as a first line for bipolar depression they talk about uh, psychotherapy and they say that lamotrigin needs to be used more um and then they talk about something like short term add ons of benzodiazepines the teacher that i told before she seems to be uh, working with that she comes with severe depression i just add a clonazepam for a few days and she becomes better for a short term that can be done and they very clearly say that there is very little uh, evidence of psychological treatment alone so if it is a bipolar don't try to go in with psychotherapy alone evidence is very less and for preventing relapse you know, they say lithium is the best and then comes other drugs again they talk about lamotrigine lamotrigine has lot of uh, literature when they come to bipolar depression nice guidelines uh, tell about uh, bipolar depression fluoxetine with olanzapine or quetiapine so they uh, give given lot of importance to quetiapine and then if there is no uh, oh, another option is to give olanzapine alone um and uh, if the patient is already on lithium optimize the dose the other guidelines all follow the same thing if you are already on lithium you should first optimize the dose of lithium and then if the lithium is uh, adequate dose you can add fluoxetin with olanzapine or quetiapine um again uh, this is the for prevention lithium is a first choice only if it is ineffective give valproate um psychological intervention it should be manual based see no evidence for by psychotherapy alone if at all giving a psychotherapy should be a manual based with clear directions rather than psychoanalytic and all and they say that um, in primary care the third point do not use questionnaires so primary care if a primary care physician the if a patient is coming with bipolar they have to refer bipolar is very difficult to be managed unless if somebody has a training in psychiatry so they nice guidelines say that in uk they have the system no general practice if it is a bipolar depression you refer don't try to diagnose using guidelines and all that, questionnaires and all and some recent uh, uh, systematic reviews i found evidence for uh clamotrigin ketamine interestingly i think kmct is a place where uh, they use ketamine a lot uh, the advantage is ketamine is an immediate response the problem is how long it will last so maybe if a severe suicidal depression the ketamine can be used to get out of that severe suicidality and then later on you can come in with other drugs lorazepam has a systematic review light treatment has a systematic review in the canadian journal 
2019. So maybe it has something to do with the seasonal affective disorder. Uh, Kvetiapin, again, has a lot of literature. Um, now a lot of uh, interest in this transcranial direct current stimulation, T TD, uh, TDCS, has an evidence, it seems. Then uh, a latest review I found where uh, lithium uh, monotherapy ineffective. Now this is a network uh, meta-analysis. So it has its own problems. They, uh, like one of the high problems with the network meta-analysis is that uh, a small uh, RCT is combined with a large RCT and the whole um, evidence gets diluted because of that. So that may not be something we need to go with. If you look at the IPS, it has taken uh, all the good things, I think. And what does IPS recommend? You, you go, if it's a bipolar depression, go with lithium or lamotrigine, quetiapine, or lansin in combination like that. And next is psychosocial and ECT. And if already on a mood stabilizer, optimize it. And add uh, bupropion. Bupropion uh, is a safer kind of SSRI you can use in a bipolar depression. Less chance of switching. And lithium, lot of evidence for preventing suicide. So uh, multiple suicide attempts, family history, go with lithium. We talked about ketamine. Um, and again, lot of controversy is there with using antidepressant. Many people say you can, but uh, most people say you have to be very careful. Um, there is a chance of a switch. So you should use only uh, for a moderate dose and uh, very carefully monitoring the uh, mood. And uh, among the second generation antipsychotics, quetiapine seems to have the most evidence, but you have to use adequate dose. So minimum 300 milligram. This is some other things that could be used for bipolar depression, and uh, very uh, less evidence for all that. Mm. And finally, it is up to the clinician. Uh, so when you take it bipolar depression, the ma different guidelines, as you see, the UK guidelines, American guidelines, Canadian guidelines, all seems to be differ. So it's a clinician's choice ultimately. And uh, you should look at uh, past history of response, family history of response, the side effects, uh, and all that, depending to, to look at which medicines you use. So it's more to do with pharmacotherapy, bipolar depression. So we know bipolar depression is not just uh, molecules. There is a, a psychological part and the social part involved. So coming to future directions. So we are looking at how to diagnose it earlier. Uh, so even, uh, because the onset is at the 20s, no? So if you can uh, diagnose at that time itself, then you can prevent a lot of um, disability due to this condition. So there are a lot of, uh, I mean, some literature with this uh, machine learning algorithms, optical coherence tomography using the pupil, see, the retina is the one part of the central nervous system can be easily, easily visualized. And uh, the machine learning uh, thing, I think, has a lot of uh, application. Because, uh, see, now smart watches are there. I am wearing a smart watch. This is a tracker. So this can measure my skin temperature. It can measure my pulse. It can measure my sleep. So when I wake up, it gives a graph. How many REM was there? Um, so if this combined with my activity, it automatically monitors and it tells me, gives me feedback. Okay, there is something problem. Uh, you are less active now, or you are more active now. You need to be careful. That can have an application in bipolar, because in bipolar, you still retain insight unlike schizophrenia. In, if I have schizophrenia, I don't know I have schizophrenia. But if I have bipolar, I know I have bipolar. And there, I think this uh, technology can help. And combined with, you know, some genetic analysis, I can map my gene, uh, or I can do an imaging, fMRI, and see, okay, this circuit is there. 
All these are exciting prospects where our diagnosis and management um, will become uh, more and more robust. Okay, uh, so that is the uh, final goal for all that. I think my time, I, I, how, much, how much time I took? More than one hour. Huh? I thought I kept a timer. Just one last thing and I leave you. Do we need sadness in our life? But of course, PG Sunday. Do you need sadness? Why? Why do you need sadness? It is so good now. Always you are happy. Why you need sadness? Why? 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 Only if there is sadness, you appreciate happiness. I would say that, see, happiness is appreciated as a contrast to sadness. It is like black or white. You can't have white without black. When you have so many good things in life, you also have to have sadness. And as human beings, we have a mechanism in our brain that gives happiness, telling us which is good for us. Remember I told dopamine circuit, dopamine, it is not with happiness, it is for learning. This circuit is there so that it helps us learn new things. So try to use that thing and try to find happiness in good things in life. With that I just end. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you sir for the wonderful session. Now I request Dr. O. V. Vasudevan Saw to hand over the memento to the speaker. Sorry. On for it. Over to the chairs for the discussion. Thank you, Sabint, uh, for an excellent presentation. Now any questions, queries, additions? From PGs and other others. Any questions, please? Modafinil, my PG thesis was on Modafinil. I used Modafinil for uh, close-up and induced hypersalivation. And uh, problem with Modafinil is that there is a risk for worsening psychosis. It's very less. And that was the reason I had to stop my PG thesis. It was an RCT. Two of my patients worsened. So when you look at the literature, it activates, right? And the problem with all these activating agents that they seems to be worsening people with psychosis and especially with some anxiety. So both patients who worsened were having anxiety. They were all schizophrenia. My thesis was not happening for hypersolution, close up in this hypersolution schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is a spectrum. So the, but some of the schizophrenics seem to be having anxiety and in them if you use modafinil, there is a risk of that excitement. They don't may not understand it as activation and they worsen. So schizophrenia and bipolar I feel ultimately comes in the same kind of thing. But uh, if you look at someone with a very psychomotor retardation and uh, they feel it's lack of energy, uh, and you are sure there is no psychotic symptom and not much anxiety, should be okay to use. Uh, one doubt, uh, my side. Uh, one case of a depression, severe depression, uh, presenting in our uh, clinic, would you start uh, antidepressant only for that or uh, antidepressant with antipsychotic or mood stabilizer? Just the uh, first episode of the episode, only yeah. under severe depression, only yeah. there is no psychotic symptoms. I will start only antidepressant along with the benzodiazepine. My preferred benzodiazepine is the clonazepam. Severe depression without psychotic symptom, uh, benzodiazepine and an SSRI, that's how I start. Okay. One other dilemma is uh, comorbid OCD. Uh, okay. Comorbid OCD is very difficult because I've seen all have been very difficult to treat. Um, they, you can't give SSRI. 
the all major treatment for OCD has been through serotonin. Even if you use fluoxetine, you have to give high dose so that it acts serotonin. But then that will worsen this mood. And it's been difficult. Uh, we have to use a balance of um, an antipsychotic that doesn't worsen obsessive symptoms. For example, clozapine, olanzapine, quetiapine. These kind of molecules seem to worsen OC symptoms. So maybe a more potent dopamine blocker like an amisulpride uh, could be tried. And then under the cover, you can try small dose SSRI and see that. You can start a SSRI along with the mood stabilizer, no? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Mood stabilizer, SSRI, no problem. Just like bipolar depression, no? You can start, no problem. Uh, one comment is that uh, this early onset uh, depression, especially adolescent with the uh, poor scholastic performance, school refusal, uh, careful about uh, bipolar depression because uh, early onset depression most uh, probably bipolar in nature. Then about uh, this uh, suicide, uh, this uh, lethal attempt is more with the, this bipolar depression. Uh, so treating with the lancipin uh, is li uh, life saving. Yes, yes. They always you have to keep in mind. Suicidality is always a big risk. Okay. Thank you, Sabin. It is an excellent presentation. Um, I must suggest the postgraduates, like uh, you should start, um, you know, making notes when such a nice presentation <coughs> occurs. To two advantages. One is, it's a process of learning. The second is, you keep track. You don't go for a nap in between. You know, even in uh, classes I remember, I, I mean, uh, even in classes I remember, like um, those days uh, before the advent of uh, <laughs> use of MDMA, people used to sleep. In, especially in Calicut Medical College, huge auditorium. <laughs> and, um, you know, some people will have, even in Enapoya, some people will have an excellent technique of just going snap without, you won't know, even know the person. So what I used to do is, now caller mic is available, I walk up and down. Go on speaking and or come down. So make it a point to make notes. And one interesting okay. comment was like, um, uh, Shakespeare, I believe, if I, if I have not been a playwright, a poet, sonnets, he would have become a psychiatrist. Because uh, I always believe uh, you can't make any presentation without a mention of Shakespeare. You mentioned that if it's only recently the lover uh, kills uh, his lover, Othello. You know, because many times uh, it, it is not just because of drugs only. A lot of psychological mechanisms, jealousy, jealousy, envy, all this promote uh, killing lovers. Several points um, which the, of the postgraduates don't depend on your checklist of symptoms, tick, tick marking, you know. Nothing to replace in psychiatry a, an excellent clinical examination. History taking, examination. Examination, mental state examination, you do it over and over again. These are all my own personal experience. Perhaps um, uh, dopamine, whenever dopamine comes to mind, pleasure principle, which of course the psychologists in uh, olden times used to say, the pleasure principle is just dopamine that way. One thing which is surprising is like, um, uh, I don't find, is amoxapine still in the market? Um, it's very effective that way, like because um, it has uh, an action as an antipsychotic because by virtue of its, uh, uh, you know, product's action and uh, the shift becomes um, very little. But of late, quetiapine has become very popular. High dose of quetiapine, uh, it prevents switches also. And um, as I said, um, even today I'm happy that several places you mentioned lithium. I'm a fan of lithium. And um, start lithium even in hypomania. It prevents depression. In olden times itself, it has recognized that lithium has an antidepressant effect. And lastly, about uh, mention about lamotrigine. Lamotrigine is an excellent drug in bipolar depression. But the problem with lamotrigine is the skin side effects. 
I had st I used to initially when the Motorin came into the market years ago, I used to use uh, uh, at quite a few occasions. But then, I had more skin reactions than carbamazepine with Lamotrigine. So it becomes really difficult. So I, I started even with stepping up the dosage. I I still remember um, one of my patients um, uh, from Telichery. Um, he. I started on small dose of lamotrigine, small, by like half tablet, daily, half BD, stepping up. It becomes really difficult that way, like. Uh, so what happened was this um, young man, uh, no, no, not an young man, a child, older child, uh, developed skin rashes and then uh, was taken to the pediatrician. The pediatrician said, measles, measles. <laughs> and then they called me, said, uh, my son, my had developed measles. Then I knew that I started him on Lamotrigine. I said, nothing doing, come immediately. I was really worried whether it will go to Stephen Johnson's. Like, uh, and then, uh, of course, it is adverse effect of uh, Lamotrigine. One second, thank you, Sabin. It was a wonderful presentation, very interesting. And I really enjoy your concept of evolution, bringing it, it like, uh, like two names who are not in psychiatry, which always comes to my mind when I think of my speciality. One is um, Shakespeare and the other is Charles Darwin. Thank you. If there is no further questions, we can wind up the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request Dr. Ovi Vasudevan, sir, to hand over the memento to the speaker. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Kamal Hussain, sir, retired DGHS, former faculty, Calicut Medical College, to hand over a token of appreciation to the chairpersons. Thank you, sir. Uh, now it's time for a 10-minute uh, tea break. I humbly request all of you to be back after a short tea break. Thank you. In 2000, and it is post-graduation from Government Medical College, Code, and it is in service from 2004. His screen area of interest is in OCD, and in his leisure time, he enjoys trekking. Our next topic is by uh, my friend uh, Dr. Jitto, the Associate Professor of Manjiri Medical College. Um, uh, the topic is dilemma in OCD. I think OCD itself is a dilemma, it's a clinical dilemma, because now the OCD is not actually considered as an independent disorder because. Now it's an intruder to all, most of the other disorders like depression, like uh, schizophrenia or and other psychotic disorder. So OCD is actually intruder to all the other areas. So I think um, to know more about this confusion, this dilemma, I think that uh, Dr. Jitu is a, a person to uh, give us a new, newer areas of dilemma in the OCD. I welcome. Uh, Dr. Rajito to start the Nothing, sir. Looking forward to hear from you.
Good morning, uh, one and all. At the outset, uh, let me thank uh, Sushil sir and his team for having me here as a speaker. And also, I thank uh, the compare for those kind words of introduction. See, I'm a little bit OCD-ish myself. <laughs> and so I am compelled to uh, begin this presentation with a brief journey through the historical dilemmas which our previous generations faced while dealing with this OCD. Those were the times when religion was the center stage of any society. And though the kings and the queens ruled the land, it was uh, the, to the religious leaders or the clerics that the common man approached to solve the different problems. Those were the times when uh, obsessions were concerned mainly around religion. People had repeated unwanted th thoughts whether it, they have committed some sin or whether they have invited the wrath of God. So there is enough and more evidence in literature of situations which are similar to what we now call as OCD. During those times, medical literature was very scarce. It was in the realm of theological literature. And it was called scrupulosity or scruples during those times. Now, Jean Charlie de Gerson in 14th century, he was a theologian and scholar. He said, extreme scrupulosity is like a pack of dogs who bark and snap at passers-by. And the best way to deal with them is to ignore them and treat them with contempt. Isn't this a fantastic and early example and advice for dealing with unwanted obsessions? Again, an English cleric in the 17th century, Jeremy Taylor, he said about OCD people, these are the persons who dare not eat for fear of gluttony, for when they are married, they are afraid to do their duty, for fear it be secretly an indulgence to the flesh, and yet they dare not omit it, for fear they should be unjust. He goes on to add, scruples is trouble where the trouble is over, and a doubt when the doubts are resolved. A church leader, poet, and theologian of the 17th century, Richard Baxton, had wrote, written in length about OCD, and he, uh, he has often, uh, he has also offered directions to help. And could this be one of the first self-help guides which we have for people with OCD? He even understood the relevance of the people around the OCD person, and he wrote, when this disease has gone very far, directions to the persons themselves are in vain because they have no reason and free will to practice them. But it is the friends about whom that we must have the directions. Then coming on to 17th, 18th century, medical science slowly came into prominence. And OCD was considered one of the symptoms of melancholy. And people started recognizing more and more obsessions other than the religious obsessions, like washing, checking, fears of syphilis, or sexual obsessions. And the physicians of that time tried phlebotomy, that is draining of the bad humor as a source, as a cure for OCD, but to no avail. Then people approach phrenology, mesmerism, psychology, philosophy, etc., to no avail. 19th century, the current day concepts began to evolve, and th at that time, the main problem was uh, for, uh, amongst the British, the Germans, the English, etc., was whether it was a disorder of the will, whether it was a disorder of the emotion or a disorder of the intellect. The French Esquirol called it monomania. He was confused whether it was a disorder of the intellect or will. Henry Dagnett, Falre, he co who called it the doubting disease, Benedict Morel, Magnan, all had their own opinions about uh, the OCD. Germans, they were little more clear when Greisinger and Otto Westphal said that it could be a disorder of the intellect. Somewhere during that period, the concept of neurasthenia came and that engulfed OCD. 
It was Pierre Janet who isolated OCD from neurasthenia and said that could be a part of psychasthenia when it is arising in the third stage of psychasthenic illness. Then came our Sigmund Freud who called it Swang's neuros. In UK, this word swang, which means forced, was translated to obsession, whereas at the same time, in the United States, the word swang was translated to compulsion, and so obsessive compulsive disorder, the word emerged as an eventual compromise at some time in the mid-20th century. Then was the era of ICDs and DSMs. ICD came in 1992, ICD-11 came in 2017. Major changes happened when this revision happened, particularly in the OCD group. During our clinical practice, we have seen body dysmorphic disorder, hypochondriasis, trichotillomania, Tourette syndrome, all having great similarity with OCD. There were various phenomenological overlaps. Also, comorbidity was common. And neurocircuitry studies found that there is involvement of frontostriatal and reward circuitry in all these disorders. So, are in these disorders under, should shouldn't these disorders be considered under a common entity? That made ICD-11 consider uh, OCD, OCD as uh, OCD was moved to OCRD group, and it was made the leader of the OCRD group from the neurotic stress-related and somatoform disorders group of OCD. Again, Tourette syndrome had great uh, phenomenological similarity with OCD and it was cross-referenced. In ICD-10, there was this subtyping that is obs predominantly obsessive, predominantly compulsive type. But uh, we know it doesn't make much uh, clinical significance while managing. So that was discarded. And another important change which happened was the qualifiers were added, like fair to good and poor to absent in the case of insight. Now that brings us to one of the important dilemmas in psychiatry, in OCD, insight in OCD. In your clinical practice, we traditionally have been taught OCD is a neurotic illness with intact insight, but that's not the case in our clinical practice. We often see patients with poor insight, which made Akiskal comment that it's a continuum of insight with neurotic OCD at one end of the spectrum and psychotic OCD at the other end. And also, in OCD, 15 to 35 percentage have got poor insight, which can lead to poor treatment outcome, poor treatment response. So the poor insight OCD will often be misdiagnosed and treated as psychosis. But one good thing remains, it responds even better to SSRIs. So going in depth, the neuropsychological profile of OCD with poor insight was uh, studied or compared to OCD with good insight and, to, and it was found that there, were, there are differences in the domains of executive function, attention, working memory, visuospatial skills, processing speed, etc. So the future challenges, we should be able to reliably distinguish poor insight from good insight, fair insight or absent insight. It's easy to say in theory, but in clinical practice, it's very difficult. And we also need to understand further the differences between good insight and poor insight groups. Because if we are able to easily identify good and poor insight groups, that can help us to have a quick neuropsychological bedside evaluation of the needed cases, which will allow us to develop tailor-made CBT or psychoeducation methods which are directed towards correcting the specific cognitive deficits, thereby improving insight and thereby bringing about an overall improvement in OCD. Very often in our clinical practice, in our OCD patients, we get psychotic symptoms and we will be stuck what to do. Uh, is our diagnosis right? But one thing is, the, there is the prevalence of OC symptoms in schizophrenia is very high. It's close to 15 to 60 percentage. And schizophrenia OCD comorbidity is around 23 percentage, which made Westphal comment. OC symptoms might be a prodrome of a psychotic illness. And this also made uh, people uh, coin the words like malignant OCD, schizo OCD, or psychotic OCD in the 1980s. So now we are stuck with few dilemmas. There are various clinical presentations in, by, in which OCD and psychosis can coexist. What is the relevance of these clinical presentations and what implications do they have on the treatment? The clinical presentations may be, uh, for OC symptoms in schizophrenia, it may be, OC symptoms will be present during the prodrome period of psychotic illness and then once the psychotic symptoms establish, the OC symptoms will settle. 
or it may be present throughout the course of the psychotic illness when it is a comorbid disorder. Or the OC symptoms will be present only during the active phase. It will settle down during the uh, phase when the psychosis wanes or it may develop just during the recovery phase of psychosis as obsessive ruminations. Very rarely, we have de novo OC symptoms also, which is associated with a typical antipsychotic use like clozapine, olanzapine, risperidone, aripiprazole, etc. Now, how do these drugs cause uh, OC symptoms? It's uh, the mechanism postulated is 5-HT2A antagonism, which is responsible for de novo or worsening of the OC symptoms. While D2 antagonism, you know, has got anti-obsessional effect. So it is this balance that is 5-HT2A D2 balance with greater 5-HT2 uh, D2 antagonism responsible for OC symptoms pathogenesis, and likewise. And so, clozapine, olanzapine, etc., can uh, cause de novo OC symptoms. At the same time, with the same logic, we can use amisulprate to treat medication induced OC symptoms in schizophrenia because it has got negligible 5 ht 2 a antagonism and selective D2D3 antagonism. Now, we have various, treat various clinical presentations. What are the treatment implications for them? Because there are various clinical presentations, there is no uniform treatment strategy. Now, if this schizophrenic patient is having pre-existing OC symptoms, you will have to treat schizophrenia with antipsychotics, and for pre-existing OC symptoms, you will have to go for adjunctive SSRIs. And very often, the psychosis or schizophrenia will be treatment resistant, and we have no other choice but to go for clozapine. And changing from clozapine to some other drug just because it worsens OC symptoms will be impractical. In that case, we will have to try adjunctive SSRIs. Again, a situation where the OC symptoms that wax and wane along with psychosis, there is no need to treat uh, OC symptoms because once the psychosis settles, OC will also settle. So antipsychotics alone may be sufficient. Now, if there are de novo OC symptoms following a typical antipsychotic use, we can go for amisulprate or try dose adjustment of the antipsychotics. Now, sometimes in our clinical practice, we come across sporadic cases of OCD, unlike the familial ones which we usually see. Now, the dilemma is, is its clinical characteristic and treatment response different from the usual familial one that we see? Uh, sporadic OCD has got a later age of onset with duration of untreated illness being less. Sexual obsessions are very common. Comorbidity is less, unlike familial type, which has got more depression and anxiety features. And looking into treatment response, the sporadic type has got a better treatment response than the familial type. So the future challenge is, is this categorization of OCD into sporadic and familial, is it valid one? And if it is a valid one, do we have separate treatment strategies for either of them? Uh, that is one thing which we will have to find out in the future. Very often, we have patients having both OCD and OCPD. They come to our clinic, and we are doubtful whether it is a part of the personality or is it OCD per se. This doubt arises because the core symptoms of OCD and OCPD overlap, like perfectionism, rigidity, cognitive behavioral inflexibility, preoccupation with details, need for mental interpersonal controls. But all these are mainly features of OCPD, particularly perfectionism, with this incompleteness feelings or not just right experiences in OCPD. These feelings are actually very difficult to differentiate amongst OCPD and OCD. And again, the important thing is, if there is this comorbidity, there is greater severity and poor treatment outcome. And we know in OCD, 25 to 45 percentage has OCPD. So how are we going to solve this dilemma? The age-old dictum, OCPD, there will be uh, compulsions only, no obsessions. And in OCPD, the thoughts are ego-syntonic. And the person considers these thoughts as very appropriate and correct. And so they rarely seek treatment, whereas the reverse is true for OCD. Now, going deeper into other cognitive domains of cognitive flexibility, planning ability, decision-making capacity, reward-delaying capacity, 
it has been found that there is impairment for OCD and OCPD, but the impairment is more for OCD than OCPD. And for uh, if we look into the cognitive domains, which are responsible, like areas in the brain which are responsible for these cognitive domains, for example, reward delaying capacity, it has been found to be associated with heightened activation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So if you are able to modulate it somehow, say for example with using RTMS, that can be considered as a cure for both OCD and OCPD. And in fact, research is going on in that direction, and in the West, RTMS is being accepted as a treatment for OCD and OCPD. Now, in the case of pediatric age group, autistic spectrum disorders, a lot many patients have this comorbid condition. The, the dilemma is the repetitive behaviors and the narrow fixated interest of ASD which look very similar to obsessions and compulsions. And top of that, pediatric OCD, 8 to 10 percentage have ASD. So we will have three clinical presentations. One is the OCD only group, which have pure obsessions and compulsions, the pure OCD group. Or they will be the AS, there will be the pure ASD group, which have repetitive behaviors, narrow fixed interest, which looks very similar to obsessions and compulsions. And then there will be this comorbidity group. Now, uh, the treatment or the diagnostic dilemma is because there will be language impairment, struggles with emotion identification, and reduced insight in ASD children, which will make it very difficult for them to convey their thoughts and intellectual states to us. And again, consider an ASD child with very high level of functioning. Then the ASD will not be that evident, and if that child is having OCD, it will mask ASD. Again, the treatment approaches for ASD and OCD are very different. Now, again, it's easy to diagnose, uh, to differentiate clinically if we for uh, ASD and OCD, if we follow these principles. The thoughts are egosyntonic in ASD, and the repetitive restrictive behaviors are a source of anxiety relief, validation, and security, and it's got a calming effect for ASD, whereas the reverse is true for OCD. And among the obsession, hoarding is very common for ASD compared to OCD. Now, if we have an ASD child who acts out, uh, as a part of restrictive behavior, acts out his or her favorite textbook characters, they uh, think of OCD for some time because they, they are more likely to have OCD than those who are having a restrictive behavior like being fixated by a toy, by an object, or who collect facts about a particular topic. Now, it has been found that the ASD OCD group has got fewer pro-social behavior, poor insight, more religious obsession, and more of hoarding compared to the ASD group. Now, think you are having an ASD child in your clinic. And if there are sudden onset new and different behaviors in that child, just think for a second whether it could be part of an OCD and are we dealing with an ASD OCD child. It's nowadays very easy to uh, diagnose comorbid ACD using the children's Y-box ASD scale and to differentiate between restrictive behaviors of ASD and compulsive behaviors of OCD we have got the obsessive compulsive inventory revised. Now regarding this treatment the unique challenge is to adapt the existing OCD treatment to meet the unique challenges of ASD because uh, we will have to modify the CBT ERP for this particular group that is ASD group uh, many, many a times the therapies might have to be given on a home-based treatment. We will have to provide them social skills training, etc. One uh, point of interest is ASD children, they are more sensitive to the activating effects of SSRIs. So you will have to start slow, start low and go slow while treating these children. An uh, in, in interesting factor is aripiprazole and risperidone, which are usually used for managing irritability in ASD. That has been, uh, that has got USFD approval in OCD. So in this ASD OCD group, you can go for aripiprazole as well as risperidone. Now the future challenges we need to face while dealing with OCD ASD children is the clinical profile has to be understood in depth and we need to develop stringent protocols for identifying this ASD OCD group and adaptations in CBT protocols have to be made. But uh, taking into consideration the functional level of ASD that the child is having. So you will have to develop unique CBT protocols. Now, suppose uh, in your OCD clinic, a lady comes, starts 
winking at you or pouting her lips. Just don't get carried away. Just uh, relax for one second. Think whether this could be tick or OCD because uh, see this is a stat what the statistics has to say. 40 percentage of uh, Tourette syndrome has got OCD and 90 percentage of Tourette syndrome has got subthreshold OCD symptoms. But jokes apart, uh, this uh, comorbid OCD symptoms in uh, tick disorders will be uh, aggressive obsessions, counting, touching, symmetry needs, etc. So the doubt arises whether tick disorders, is it a subtype of OCD or is it a comorbidity? Now, the people with tick disorders, they say they have got premonitory urges. It's a sensory restlessness which they experience. And to ward off this sensory experience, restlessness, they adopt ticks. So isn't it similar in nature to our compulsions? Moreover, uh, CSTC loose abnormalities, uh, MRI volumetric findings, etc. are very similar in Tourette syndrome and OCD. But there are some differentiating features. In OCD, the compulsions are associated with autonomic arousal. And there is definitely a complex thinking process behind compulsions. Whereas in tics, there are no autonomic arousal. And it's just an involuntary response to a very short-lived sensory symptoms. OCD, obsessive contaminations are common. Whereas in tics, it's accounting rituals, the need to touch, rub, or tap items, and symmetry needs, which are more common. Now, there is a six-year-old boy uh, with no family history of OCD. Suddenly, overnight, they develop OCD and tics, and it's associated with aneurysis, dysgraphia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, impulsivity, emotional ability, etc. Can anybody tell the diagnosis, postgraduates? Sudden onset, that's the clue. Overnight development of OCD and tics. Another clue, uh, she had fever two weeks back. What it could be? Pandas. Yeah, pandas. A pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders after streptococcal infection. But now the concept has evolved a little more and there are various other types like PANS, a pediatric acute neuropsychiatric syndrome where along with OCD and tics, the child will have food refusal. And there is no need for uh, group A streptococcal infection to make this diagnosis. Other subgroups are also there, childhood uh, acute neuropsychiatric syndrome, pediatric infection triggered acute neuropsychiatric disorders, etc. So I'm not going to the details of that. Now, very often in our clinical practice, we have uh, patients who come with sexual obsessions and compulsions. It's very difficult and tricky situation because here the feelings of immorality are at play and the patients don't develop this. 8 to 10 percentage, there is evidence, 8 to 10 percentage of adults have go, with OCD have got sexual obsessions and I'm pretty sure the incidence will be much, much more. And these sexual obsessions and compulsions, they are more time consuming and more dysfunctional. And in the case of sexual compulsions, overt is very easy to identify, but in the covert ones where, the, where they will adopt avoidance or counting or reciting rituals, it is uh, very difficult to identify. And uh, these covert rituals in sexual obsessions will be more like thought control techniques. Now, sometimes people come to us saying they have got excessive masturbatory activity before branding them off as uh, hypersexual individuals, just think for a second whether it's the, an unwanted urge, then it's an impulse control disorder, or is it a compulsion in response to some sexual obsession, so there is built-up anxiety, and to relieve that built-up anxiety, he or she is masturbating. So uh, that point has to be kept in mind. And for managing sexual obsession, the sad thing is there is no tailored medications. Patients don't report and we don't discuss because of our own insecurities. Imagine giving ERPs to a patient with sexual obsession. Unique tailored ERPs. It's not practical. It's very, very difficult. Now, sometimes patient comes to us with uh, obsessive doubts about the sexual orientation. They are preoccupied by thoughts about the orientation. If it's a pure homosexual, there is no doubt. He does not report intrusive and persistent homosexual thoughts. It's not at all distressing to him. But he, uh, this, the next, uh, next group is what is pro, uh, creating a problem for us. Heterosexual with obsessive thoughts of being a homosexual. 
for them the thoughts are distressing there is no urge or desire to be a homosexual it is ego dystonic but they will have a tendency to engage in thought action fusion that is magical thinking about homosexuality that is the mere thought of being homosexual means they are attracted to people of the same sex again paraphilia and ocd pedophilia where the person is having recurrent sexual thoughts about children it's very easy to differentiate because uh, in a true pedophile the thoughts will be ego syntonic and pleasurable and to the extent that the person will often claim that the children welcome their sexual advances whereas if it is part of ocd these thoughts are ego dystonic disturbing and distressing suicidality obsessive suicidal thoughts are very common in ocd and suicidality is found to increase with comorbid anxiety and depression and past history of suicidality and it has been found that there is a high rate of mood instability in ocd so it's the total psychological burden of ocd plus mood instability plus depression which contributes to self harm rather than only obsessions of harming the self it's a point but uh, the other factors are more important than just obsessive suicidal thoughts eating disorders and ocd we know anorexia nervosa 30 to 60% and bulimia nervosa 20 to 40% can lead to uh, can have ocd and the factors commonly seen are perfectionism negative emotionality and drive for thinness perfectionism and negative emotionality common to ocd and ocpd but uh, there are studies which say it's more related to ocpd than ocd but if a person comes to you with eating disorders just try to elicit ocd in them also and when coming to management proper uh, the one big issue the big first issue itself is the terminology confusions we have in lot many terms response partial response remission recovery relapse and various guidelines are using various definitions for them now for, luckily for us recently the ips uh, task force for clinical practice guidelines have come up with this chart they say response is that situation when after treatment the criteria for ocd is met but vibox score has come down to more than 35 percentage for at least one week it is partial response when the vibox uh, reduction is between 25 to 35 percentage it can be called remission when the vibox vibox has come down to 12 for at least one week and recovery when the vibox has come down to 12 for more than one year and after remission and recovery the patient can be called relapse in relapse if the criteria for ocd is again met and vibox score has risen up above 13 again confusion exists regarding terms treatment resistance and refractoriness treatment resistant ocd ocd that remains clinically significant despite optimal application of proven treatment this is a canadian guideline saying what is this optimal i presume it is two trials of ssris treatment refractory ocd ocd that remains clinically significant despite rigorous application of many evidence based treatments including those for which evidence is more limited now coming to treatment proper we know for ocd the treat, first line of treatment is cbt that to erp but uh, the situation in our country is very pathetic we have only around 2000 clinical psychologists and among them uh, only a handful might have got proper training in giving uh, ocd specialized uh, cbts so we have to adopt for we have to go for uh, pharmacotherapy now we have this whole armamentarium of drugs ssris clomipramine venlafaxine all in high doses now the dilemma is how to choose among them ssris and clomipramine studies are there both significantly more effective than placebo and network meta analysis says there is no efficacy advantage for either group meta analysis and rcts again say tolerability profile is better for ssris so the safer and better first line option are ssris now there are studies uh, comparing venlafaxine versus paroxetine versus clomipramine and again there is no difference in efficacy amongst these three but the sad thing is there is no placebo controlled trials so uh, just because of that venlafaxine is a second line option now how to choose among the ssris again uh, we have to depend on meta analysis and head to head comparisons and they say there is no efficacy superiority for any ssri <clears throat> but uh, differences exist in adverse effects and drug interactions 
but is, that is not clinically significant. So choose an SSRI for an individual patient based on factors such as previous response, comorbidity, tolerability, adverse effects, cost and drug interactions. Now we always go by the dictum, anti-obsessional dose is higher than antidepressant dose. There are studies uh, to prove this, meta-analysis of fixed dose comparison studies for fluoxetine and, it and its equivalents in the high, medium and low dose, there were they were compared greater efficacies with higher doses and all three dose ranges were significantly more effective than placebo. But the point is, the increased efficacy comes at the cost of poor tolerability. So uh, we can uh, decide, we can go for higher doses but choose medium or low dose depending upon the emergence of adverse effects. Now further management dilemma is, how, once this patient has started responding, how long should we continue the trial? Meta-analysis of 17 RCTs found SSRIs are separate from placebo. They get separated from placebo as early as two weeks. But clinically, it's not clinically meaningful. Only minor improvements happen. And to get clinically meaningful improvement, we have to wait for at least a few months. So to uh, get better understanding of this, APA has come up with its guidelines, which says we should upwardly titrate the SSRI to the maximum FP FDA approved dose by four to six weeks and continue in that dose for another six to eight weeks. And our IPS expert group says continue this maximally tolerated dose for at least 12 weeks. So with all this first line interventions, remission is possible for around 10 to 40 percentage and partial response for 40 to 60 percentage. Now what to do with this partial responders? One option is you can continue with the initial trial further with, uh, of SSRI or you can go for augmenting agents like risperidone in the low dose 1 to 3 mg, aripiprazole in the dose 5 to 10 mg, but that has to be given for at least 8 weeks. Or you can go for memantin 10 to 20 mg, lamotrigine 100 mg, and it has been found that memantin is superior to lamotrigine. You can try on 10 4 to 8 mg. And with all this, another 10 percentage will show significant symptom reduction. Now we can also try clomipramine augmentation of SSRI. But we should be wary of the side effects like seizure potential or cardiac, cardiac abnormalities or neurological abnormalities. Mirtazapine augmentation has been found to hasten the response. Buspiron, lithium, clonazepam, no effect. Now, partial responders, that is those who have shown some response to the first SSRIs, switching of SSRIs is not advisable because it may lead to loss of the response to the earlier SSRIs. Now switching in a partial responder is recommended only if there are severe persisting symptoms or upon failure of the other augmenting strategies such as atypical antipsychotics. Now consider this group non-responders. Then you will have to switch over to the second SSRI or you will have to switch over to clomipramine or go, in, or go to venlafaxine. That will bring about a 40 to 50 percent response for the second SSRI. And uh, we can also try, for the rest, we can also try IV ketamine, which has got an acute anti-obsessional effect. Again, we can go for ultra-high dose SSRIs, acid low from around 40 to 50, or sertraline 400 mg. But these are all experimental trials. IV clomipramine was also tried in the West, not here. Then the group which remains is the treatment refractory group. That will be around 10 percentage. What to do with them? ECT, not at all recommended, but uh, it can be used if there is suicidality, severe mood or psychotic disorders. RTMS, it's not recommended, not US FDA approved, but in the West for various, uh, in various centers these are being tried, particularly the deep, uh, deep uh, right-sided uh, dorsolateral or uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex. These areas are being focused for RTMS. Transcranial direct current stimulation needs further evaluation. Ablative surgeries, because of the risk involved, nobody does it now. DBS, deep brain stimulation. Uh, again, in India, it's not approved. It can be recommended for treatment uh, refractory OCD patients. Now, DBS, the outcome is, uh, the dictum is two-third of the patients does two-third well. That is the response rate for DBS. Uh, in India, uh, it will cost around uh, 8 to 15 lakhs for DBS and there is one doctor 
Parekh Doshi at Jeslok Hospital who is doing this DBS. Now, once the patient has started improving and he has improved, how long should we maintain the treatment? Anyway, the treatment should be reviewed after 6 to 12 months and the guidelines say maintain medication for at least 12 months to reduce the relapse risk. Earlier age of ACD onset, OCD onset, increased illness duration, presence of comorbidities and a positive family history seem to predict greater rates of persistence. Now, very often what we do in our clinical practices, it was somewhat almost a lifelong treatment for an OCD patient once he has remitted. Now, if medication has to be discontinued, this should be done gradually over a period of months rather than weeks. And very often, we discontinue medicines and uh, ask the patient to report to us uh, once the symptoms resurface. Reinstating medication at the first sign of symptoms do not have any established evidence of efficacy. Sometimes in our OCD clinic, while the patient is on uh, high-end SSRIs, uh, high-dose SSRIs, they come to us with manic switch. It's very rare in pure OCD patients. And in the, if that happens, look for comorbid mood disorder. And uh, one funny point to note is that after the development of a manic episode, the OCD will subside. Now, if the person is thus diagnosed to have bipolar comorbidity with OCD, you should definitely go for a mood stabilizer along with cautious use of SSRI. And treatment of BPAD should gain precedence of over OCD because of the social disruption in mania and the suicidal risk involved in depression. Akathesias, TDs and dystonias are occasional occurrences. It, the theory behind it is rapid dose escalation of the SSRI and abnormal glutaminergic transmission through limbic system has been implicated. Uh, fluoxamine with a half-life of less than 24 hours, that's a close to 15 hours, which will, uh, when given once daily dose, it will lead to inter-dose withdrawal and rapid blood level changes. And this is considered to be responsible for the dystonias and other uh, extrapyramidal symptoms. Oculogyric crisis have been reported with uh, fluoxamine. Now, if the lady, OCD lady is pregnant, is in pregnancy uh, and lactation, See, the choice of drug depends on the safety data, the severity of the illness, and the benefit versus risk to the fetus. If the lady is just planning pregnancy, supplement with folate, discuss with them, psychoeducate them, and we should have an active liaison with the obstetricians, the ultrasonologists, and the pediatricians. If the OCD was diagnosed at the time of pregnancy, wait and watch will be the best policy. If available, you can go for CBT and ERP. And if the lady was in was having OCD, it has remitted, now she is pregnant. If you want, you can attempt to withdraw the SSRI gradually, but definitely watch for relapse. You know, SSRIs are a big issue uh, as a major teratogen. Uh, paroxetin can lead to septal defects. In the newborn, we have to think of serotoninergic toxicity and SSRI discontinuation because when the mother and fetus get separated, these are the issues which we can expect. It is safe, uh, only very little excreted in breast milk, so relatively safe during breastfeeding. Suppose there is this perimenopausal woman with OCD who comes to us uh, complaining of hot flashes. 70 to 80% of them have hot flashes. The treatment recommended is hormone replacement therapy, but we know it has got its own side effects. But the thing is, SSRIs and SNRIs have got a a good, uh, uh, are good treatment options for, hormone repl uh, for hot flashes uh, in these kind of patients. Uh, but another important point is, Suppose we have this uh, lady, OCD lady, with breast cancer. Just ask what medication she is on, anti-cancer agent. If she is on tamoxifen, just think uh, whether uh, we are uh, causing any harm to the patient because SSRIs can interfere with the CYP2D6 metabolism of tamoxifen and can lead to tamoxifen toxicity. In that case, uh, SNRIs are a better choice. Another important area which we have to deal when treating OCD patients, particularly pediatric OCD patients, is family accommodation, which will lead to increased symptom severity and poor treatment outcome. And virtually all parents report that they engage in some form of accommodation in one way or the other. And on top of that, if the parents are having some obsessional beliefs, that will further add to family accommodation. The sad thing is there are no accepted treatment guidelines to manage family accommodation. 
Now, as yes, uh, Mohan Chandran sir was pointing out, ethical dilemmas that in psychiatry is a big moral question. We, in our day-to-day -day practice, comes with various ethical dilemmas, particularly in OCD also. But we have to abide by the principles of non-maleficence, confidentiality, autonomy, justice, veracity, etc., while dealing with these patients. Just see this case scenario. Here is an anesthetist. He is found to have great precision and exactness at his work, and that has started interfering with his work. The cases are getting delayed in the theater. Psychiatric consultation was done, and he was diagnosed to have OCD. But he is not for medication. He says, I know what these drugs do. I am an anesthetist. Drugs are my job. So he prefers to approach a psychologist. We have no other way. We have to accept what he says. That is the autonomy principle which is at play. But few months later, he was found self-administering ketamine. And when confronted, he says, I have got evidence. Dr. Saheb from uh, KMCT has said, IV ketamine is good for, uh, I, has got acute anti-obsessional effect. So I am following that. Now, should we report to the authorities or not? Here, respect for law and justice are the principles involved. We have to respect the law, so we should report to the authorities. We have to show justice to the patients because he is, this anesthetist is doing a very responsible job, so they have to be reported. Consider this case, a 30-year-old lady, short stay home supervisor. She is on OCD, she is on treatment for OCD since 16 years of age. Married six years, uh, two years back, now planning to conceive. She discontinued medicine six months back. And uh, her logic is, medicines might have contaminated my ex. Now she wants to postpone conception by at least one more year. We know it's not needed, but uh, do no harm. That is the principle we follow, and again, we should respect uh, autonomy of the patient. Later, her friend phones up and she says that, she is having sexual thoughts about her inmates in the short stay home. Now we Google up the supervisor and the short stay home. Now is Googling, is it ethical? It is ethical if performed in the interest of promoting patient care and well-being. And it is unethical if it is done just to satisfy your personal curiosity. Now again, OCD, though it's a subtle disease, uh, very often we will have to interact with the judiciary also. See for example this pedophile OCD. Actually this guy is not a pedophile but he is obsessed with the concern that he or she is a pedophile and that he or she might have behaved inappropriately toward the children. So this can lead to false confession on the part of the person. Again the same happens with HOCD or homosexual OCD where pathological obsessions about sexual orientation and potential conduct arising from putative orientation can lead to false confession. OCD people can turn violent when another person inadvertently or deliberately disrupts or try to interrupt their obsession. Sex offenders, stalkers, fire setters, child porn hoarders, all might have OCD, OCPD, etc. So, when dealing with the court, uh, just sharing the OCD diagnosis with the court may not be enough. How the disorder was relevant to the commission of the criminal conduct is more important. And sometimes we'll be stuck when we are asked opinion about the admissibility of the confessions made in the court by the person as previously mentioned in the case of pedophile OCD or homophile OCD. Now, how the OCD symptomatology influenced the accused person's criminal responsibility is the responsibility of the court. And often, the OCD diagnosis, if directly related to the crime, may somehow mitigate the blameworthiness. To conclude, uh, let me quote James S. Julian, uh, the author of uh, A Secret Life. In 2019, he said, for decades, I constantly search for different medications and more effective therapies to control my OCD, all in vain. No psychiatrist, no psychologist, no parent or family member, no human being who suffer from OCD can realistically understand the insidiousness, the intensity, or level of debilitation the disorder brings. Just two weeks back, uh, I happened to hear that, uh, uh, the words of our Prof. Mohan Chandran sir when he was chairing a session. He said, psychiatry is a unique subject. There is no easy solution for uh, any illness in psychiatry. There is no one word equation, dilemmas are there, dilemmas will be there in psychiatry. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for the illuminating session. Now over to the chairpersons for the discussion. Dr. Jittu, the delivery was excellent, Thank you. informative and to the point. I thought you were uh, actually obsessed with the history, but uh, later you came out with an excellent description of uh, the clinical side. The, you explained about the categorical approach, uh, the importance of insight uh, and uh, OCD with uh, other uh, disorders, other clinical uh, states and uh, role of uh, drugs, SSRI, and OCD plus OCPD. I think you have, uh, you have uh, really done a wonderful job uh, dealing with all these issues, sex, uh, sex and uh, OCD, suicide OCD, or these all, uh, most, most of the areas are covered. So I think we are already, uh, we are learning, uh, running late. So I ask uh, the audience to come up with some questions. I probably their dilemma is almost over now, but still they will have some doubt. <laughs> My job was to create more dilemmas in them. <laughs> I think I am successful. <laughs> uh, you have mentioned that, uh, that ECT is not recommended for uh, OCD. Mm -hmm. So depression it is recommended. Yeah. Uh, both uh, cases there is a deficiency of serotonin. Mm -hmm. So it is not recommended in case of uh, OCD. Why? Yeah. Uh, because uh, See, uh, in depression it has been USFDA approved, whereas uh, ECT is not USFDA approved for OCD. Even IPS guidelines doesn't say ECT is recommended for OCD. Uh, just here, uh, one, to sh just to share one case was there where this uh, dilemma was whether sexual obsession or uh, whether it's a addiction. So this guy, he's having the sexual thoughts, but he has, he enjoys it, but he wants that to stop. Mm. So that comes under hypersexuality, right? But he wants to, mm. he, he doesn't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. He is saying he doesn't want that. So that is one dilemma where we will have to explore further and decide. <laughs> the, another thing, the deep brain stimulation, uh, ah. it, lure the, my classmate is there, ah. he is uh, doing it. Here in Kerala. Kerala. Lourdes. Oh. He is doing, he's already completed. The Not for OCD. Oh. Uh -huh. He's done for Parkinsonism. Uh -huh. But then the same similar technology uh -huh. can be done. But it's very costly, you know. 8 to 15 I is think, what I... Uh, less than 10 lakhs, I think. Uh -huh. Okay. Just adding to what Sabin was saying, uh -huh. regarding sexual obsessions and uh -huh. sexual addiction, uh -huh. if you look at addiction per se, it's something called an impulsive compulsive disorder. Uh -huh. and if you take from pathological gambling going up to sexual addiction, it goes from serotonin all the way to dopamine. So sexual addiction is actually around, around in the same area where Sabin is interested. Uh -huh. Dopaminergic drugs will do better. Isn't so that the same reason why uh, internet addictions are not being considered here? The problem with internet addiction is it's more impulsive, compulsive, but mm. it's more around the serotonergic, not the dopaminergic mm. And the other point I have to stress is that I think uh, 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 what you said is actually wrong. Mm. You are able to actually clear all the dilemmas. You have not mm. created any dilemmas. <laughs> it was an excellent talk. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? The one, just one question. Uh, see, you told about insight, importance of insight. Should we need to treat a OCD uh, patient with a good insight, with the drugs, or you can just refer this patient to a clinical psychologist? If a person is having good insight, he will definitely come for treatment. Okay. That much part is clear. Now, how to treat OCD? The first line of treatment is definitely ERP, CBT. Only thing is, we don't have the facility out here. So okay. we go for uh, anti obsessional agents. agents. What about the role of OCP, uh, SSR is an OCPD, whether should we treat uh, these OCPDs with the drugs? Most of us treat, <laughs> but uh, outcome will be doubtful. Okay. I think, thank you. I think that, uh, 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 Montans.
Many times, uh, clinically, over the years, I have found it very difficult to really differentiate OCD and depression, which comes, it is some, something like cart and horse, then, which comes first, which comes second. Uh, to dilate that, that uh, statement, uh, I would um, recall a patient of mine, a young man uh, who came with all the features of classical depression. He was withdrawn. He was uh, rather initially crying spells were there. Later he became apathetic and uh, not doing any job, not going for any work. And then he was brought, um, all the features of depression was narrated by his relatives, classical depression. But I saw him and maybe kind of an intuition or I, should I say uh, experience, I was not prepared to admit he has had a full course of antidepressant. Perhaps that would have been a clue for me. He was treated by antidepressant by other psychiatrists uh, with not much of an improvement. Like for over a period of time, I found out that even with 10 milligram, even the worst psychotic depression would improve SSRI, fluoxetine, or uh, better still, acetylopram. So I sent off all the relatives. He was very withdrawn and uh, I asked questions. Why are you feeling guilty? It's because of his compulsion. The compulsion was masturbation. He was continuously masturbating and he slowly, gradually developed the idea that, uh, you see, they have that equation. Uh, one drop of semen is how many? How many? 60 mm -hmm. drops of blood. I don't know mm -hmm. whether it has changed. It was, say, it was there right from my uh, youth. And um, this fellow was continuously doing that and he was counting. <laughs> you know, that's part of obsession. You'll, how, many, how, how many drops would have gone and how many blood... Uh, and then, incidentally, he got tired, exhausted, because his blood is being drained. And in that case, I, I, if somebody was um, uh, to really diagnose him as depression or OCD, I would find it very difficult. OCD is in the background. I still remember if the OCD is there. Like, um, uh, it is something like uh, in those days, uh, when depression were not, when I, we were students, depression were no, not perceived that much. He used to say, any OCD, young man, you should think of schizophrenia, you know. It is something like OCD, clinical presentation, and schizophrenia looking like even, <laughs> there were cartoons like that, uh, looking from... Uh, so it becomes really difficult. And, and my, my own perception would be like, um, you can't equate this uh, with uh, many of our experiences to amines, biogenic amines, dopamine, this and uh, uh, serotonin. Very, very difficult. I mean, these are all intertwinkled and, um, and how the brain works, how the international neurons work. Even today, it is um, in spite of all even functional uh, neuroanatomical studies, uh, will not give an answer. Perhaps uh, the only thing is that um, a detailed clinical examination emphasizing again what I have said well, the, after Sabin's present, a thorough examination and thinking of the possibilities like, see for example, this person would have been uh, gone t with few prescriptions of a combination of anti-psychotics and uh, anti-depressants. But then the understanding, the explanation, and without, um, I mean, who said about uh, the dearth of psych psychologists? You only said, you know, 2,000 psychologists. And even, um, honestly, any, any psychologist in the crowd? Oh, sorry, with due apologies, um, uh, many a time, uh, psychologists are more theoretically oriented. And... Um, unless the, they persistently work in a clinical orientation, they are not able to, with due apologies, um, yeah, not um, uh, oriented to this differentiation of OCD. And many times, recently, psychologists are taken off the stick back 
tick box, uh, you know, examination, what is this OCD questionnaire, this questionnaire, that questionnaire, that questionnaire gives you an answer. But clinical, clinical examination, addressing to the postgraduate students, uh, is the most important thing in differentiating. Thank you. And this boy really got helped. He got relieved. Uh, when I explained to him this, this equation is not correct. Uh, you know, like for example, uh, um, you know, how I explained, um, I don't know whether I should say, <laughs> say this. For example, if a person has uh, uh, innate sexual desire which is very intense, how many times, uh, you know, especially youngsters uh, would have engaged in uh, sexual intimacies? Then you start counting that, do they do that? No, no, no. So he was so, so relieved when he was explained this equation is all, um, you know, periodical based uh, uh, equations. Um, so that's more important than the explanation. So taking history, doing a, a intense examination, even if you do all the studies and all, cannot substitute that history, history, history examination. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, sir has clearly discussed about the dilemmas in OCD. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request Dr. Shivadasan KK Saw to hand over the memento to the speaker. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Abdul Rasak, sir, consultant psychiatrist, Government Medical College, Manjeri to hand over a token of appreciation to the chairpersons. Next session is on a treatment modality that is undergoing a lot of research development and advances in recent years, the depot antipsychotics. And uh, to chair the session, I invite uh, Dr. Madhav Das Sir, uh, retired superintendent MHC Calicut, and Dr. Abdul Rasak Sir, consultant psychiatrist, Manjeri Medical College, onto the dais. Thank you, sir. And I humbly, re I, I humbly invite the renowned Dr. Anil Kakunje, sir, onto the dais, the head of the Department of Psychiatry, Yenopoya Medical College, Mangalore, who has come all the way from Mangalore to share with us the knowledge and insights about Depo and antipsychotics. Uh, sir is a HOD of Enipoya Medical College, Mangalore. Sir is a gold medalist in MD Psychiatry. He is an editor of many books and among them are 2000 plus MCQs plus Culture Bound Syndrome and Rehabilitation Psychiatry. He nearly did 85 publications. He received Professor Regram Distinguished Young Teachers Award from IPSKC in 2018. Is currently the chair of IPS Publication Committee, editorial board member of South Zone Publication. Thank you. Now I hand over to the chair. Now from the realm of uh, two clinical entities, we now come to the one management strategy that is mainly for uh, uncooperative patients. And uh, we have an eminent speaker who can hold you spellbound for the next 20 or 25 minutes or half an hour. So uh, we have Anil Kakunje. Uh, one thing I think you missed out in while describing him was he's an excellent quiz master also. I listened to his 
quiz. He is a good quiz master as well. Okay. Uh, without much ado, the stage is yours, sir. Very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for the warm introduction. And the topic allotted to me is on Depo antipsychotics. The current status, so I would cover the past, the present, and a bit of what is in store for future, and uh, some practical tips on Depo antipsychotics. Coming to the topic per se, we'll start with the word Depo. I think when we hear Depo, we all remember KSRTC Depo. So that is the first thing which comes to my mind uh, when we hear, hear the word Depo. The other place uh, where we hear Depo is the ammunition Depo. So I start PGs, I mean when I teach I ask uh, what do you mean by Depo? So it is a place where things are stored. So Depo antipsychotics is something where antipsychotics is stored and then slowly disseminated or distributed. So we have something where something is stored and circulated and distributed. And to start with, we have two kinds of depots. The majority what we believe is or we use commonly is the injectable depot. But then we have oral depot also on it about antipsychotics. So with this introduction, now I will cover for the next about 40, 40, 30, 45 minutes introduction of depot antipsychotics, the benefits, the advantages and the disadvantages. Antipsychotics, long-acting injections, the LAI, which I will uh, briefly call as LAI, the antipsychotic long-acting injections. And uh, briefly on the individual LAIs, what all are there. The pharmacology, briefly about what PGs or uh, clinicians ought to know. Few practical tips about using these things and uh, finally conclusion. So, I'm sure all of us uh, treat uh, patients and uh, if you ask me about uh, chronic patients, schizophrenia, bipolar, where we commonly use these things, I think about 30% uh, of our clientele who come to us come with relapses. They, we see them because they frequently come back with relapses because they don't take poor insight, not taking medicine for various reasons and so on. And, uh, if you ask me the usage of anti depot antipsychotics, uh, I think it would be less than about 10% in majority of our uh, practice. It's quite less. But then the relapses and uh, the cases which come back because of non-adherence is quite high. So there is a big mismatch about people coming to us by not taking medicines and we have something where we can give something where we can help them and we are not using it probably to the best potential. So we look at this dilemma, what is there in the practice. So mainly the illness which probably where it is used is one is schizophrenia, the other one is a bipolar disorder. And the problem is both ways, people don't take medicines, there is increase in symptoms and there, when there is a height of worsening of symptoms, they stop medicines and it both ways creates problem. And with each relapse, there is worsening of the cognitive functions and there is worsening even after the recovery in the functioning. So we need to prevent these episodes which is happening and uh, Depo antipsychotics would help in improving compliance or adherence and PG ought to know what is the difference between compliance and adherence and uh, reduce relapses. And uh, definitely majority and almost all of the studies have proven that it reduces hospitalization rates. So if you look at the cost factor, the oral tablets may look much cheaper, but then uh, if you include the hospitalization rates to the non-compliance, I think uh, it would way outweigh the disadvantages of the cost if you consider long-acting. So what are the benefits we have with the long-acting injectables? So one good advantage is the drug delivery, you are assured that it is there in the body because someone, a health professional is giving so that is assured there is a consistent drug delivery system and there is a predictable bioavailability unlike oral medicines because it passes through first pass metabolism, the body system varies, the number of the absorption what it, it uh, a person has it varies from person to person and injectables it is uh, more predictable. It eliminates the risk where patient deliberately skips it, forgets it and so on and uh, sometimes overdosing because these are the patients who because bipolar, schizophrenia, tendency to have uh, sometimes overdosing, suicidal attempts are common. 
So that risk is also eliminated. Avoidance of covert non-netherence. Sometimes they come to you, take medicines, but then they keep it in the bag and don't take it. So for a family member, they are uh, coming for follow-up, but then he may not take it. So that can be avoided if you start anti oral uh, uh, depo antipsychotics. Immediate identification of patients when they don't come for injection. So someone is on regular follow-up, you give monthly injection, he doesn't turn up for one month uh, repeat uh, prescription, you know he is not taken. So that can be ensured. There is no question of forgetful, forgetfulness, which is one of the usual reasons for non-compliance. And uh, the other major reason is uh, help is you can conceal the medicines. So many times I use one of these indications to give depo antipsychotics, especially for students, married ladies, and so on, where taking the tablet becomes difficult in the husband's house or in the hostel kind of setting, where everyone comes to know someone is popping tablet. So this ensures that uh, that can be concealed. So there are a whole lot of benefits of using uh, depo antipsychotics. Now what are the disadvantages? Why people are hesitant to use depo antipsychotics? So one is probably to give depo antipsychotics, you, we need to know a little bit of the dynamics, the pharmacokinetics and dynamics a little more compared to oral tablets. Because once you inject, there is no question of taking it back. So you need to have a good knowledge about the LA, what you are giving, that is one. Adverse effects probably is little more with antipsychotics because once you give, then it, you cannot stop it because you have already given, then you have to face it. So stopping and reducing dose is not possible. Unlike in oral medicines, you give a fine energy or, less, or lack of autonomy. So Dr. Jitu was telling much about autonomy. So some patients feel that there is no control. He cannot decide taking in and take, not taking and so on. So a bit of autonomy is gone because someone else is injecting it. Health professionals need to deliver LA, so he need to take help of doctor, nurse, or some person to take the drug. Few LAs need some storage uh, regulations, reconstitution, administration, and some special precautions related to specific drugs. So at times, this can be a little problematic because drugs like probably Respiridone need some cold, uh, cold storage. You need to have an injection. You need to buy it from a specific store and things like that. And the last one probably related to the second generation is problem with the cost. So these are probably the negatives. But then if you choose the right patient and uh, the right uh, clinical scenario, I think it can do wonders. Now coming to the evolution of the LAs. So it starts somewhere in the 1960s with the flufenazine, the first one, which we still continue to use even after about uh, 70 years. So something which is very effective. And then you have uh, flufenazine, enantate, deconate, which gen next uh, in the line. Then you have haloperidol. Then you actually had flupenthixol. Then you have zuclopenthixol. And the first, second generation was the respiridone. And then paliperidone, olanzapine, and then few others are also coming now. And the paliperidone also, there are newer ones with the better options about monthly, tri-monthly, and so on. So there has been good progress over the years. Don't go because it, you are pushing to the muzzle, because you are giving IM, it won't go. And always there is a tendency to splash between the needle and the syringe, because these are oil-based. It's an oil, so it won't easily go. And the tendency to splash is very high. You need to actually hold between the, uh, the needle and the syringe, and then slowly push, because these are oil, unlike the second generation ones, which are actually aqueous-based, water-based, because you just push, it just goes inside, because it is water-based. So, and uh, the oil base is actually the sea same or coconut oil. Now coming to the list, what are the options we have? Stopped production, but then one more company has actually started. So this is still available. And perfinazine, which is now a little outdated. So these are the options among the first generation. And oil, all these are oil-based ones. And then you have the second generation, a little costlier ones, but works much better. You have the respiridone. Eripropozole is there, which are microspirus. But then uh, this is not available in India now. You have a second generation crystalline forms, which is the olanzapine. I think uh, many of you would have used. We have two versions, which is one for immediate release and the depot one. So I will concentrate mainly on the depot ones. And uh, olanzapine roughly is about 1,000 rupees cost and available in crystal forms. Reconstitution uh, we have to do before giving. And uh, then you have the paliperidone, which is also available. And we have good options among the second generation ones and uh, these are widely used in the first generation and probably available free in most of the government setups. 
Now coming individually to few of these drugs which we know or commonly use. Flufenazine, the first one, so it's a piperazine derivative and uh, as I said it is the base is the same oil. The plasma half-life peaks by about uh, 7 to 14 days. So there is no immediate uh, result what you see unlike drugs. So it takes some time for you to show some results and generally a steady state is after five half-lives. So if the half-life is about uh, two weeks, so to see a good result, it will take about two months to two and a half months the benefit. So you cannot expect any immediate benefit with these depot antipsychotics, but works very well for maintenance and people who are non-adherent. Over a period of time, it shows good results. Smoking uh, reduces the levels and it's generally available in 25 mg per ml or the 50 mg ampule. So roughly one ampule is about 50 mg, which can be given once in two weeks on and around. And the cost is quite cheap, about 50 rupees. So if you divide 50 rupees by two weeks, it is hardly about two rupees per day. So that is the cost and I think uh, affordability shouldn't be a problem to take this. So about two weeks uh, administration, it's one of the first long-acting drug, uh, LAI and uh, cheaper, available in government uh, setups almost freely. The negatives are probably the EPS and tardive dyskinesia when giving on a long run because these are first generation ones and uh, there is no loading dose option, so you'll have to wait for about two weeks to see the results, uh, uh, good results. So, few things about metabolism, it crosses placenta, so breast milk, so not good for pregnancy, lactation and so on, excreted in urine and um, it is of particular value for treatment of chronic sclerophenia who are generally who are having poor insight, uh, refuse medicines and so on. The next one is flupenthixol, the another uh, thiosan about two weeks, so steady state is only about after about two to three months and uh, you see two months, so for steady state, so action comes a little slowly even with the uh, flupenthixol. It comes in 20 mg and 40 mg per 2 ml vials. So fairly well tolerated and uh, maintenance dose again is about 20 to 40 mg every two to four weeks. So you have an option to give even monthly. So people who are fairly doing well, require very low dose, you can give up to a month. So it has uh, the one, uh, something unique about flupenthixol is that having mild mood elevating property and uh, a little bit of uh, usage even in uh, people with personality disorder, borderline personality disorders, antisocial, people have tried in all those things. So. Uh, and people who are not compliant with bipolar disorder, people have tried uh, and for negative symptoms, uh, flupenthixol. The cost comes to about uh, 300 to 400 rupees uh, per injection. The next one, probably not commonly used, was used uh, extensively earlier is the haloperidol. So haloperidol deconate again dissolved or in the, uh, the base is the sea same seed oil. So it again uh, is uh, given to the gluteus muscle and uh, it slowly hydrolyzes, it enters systemic circulation very slowly, it's lipophilic, so gets absorbed very slowly, that's the advantage. And uh, it lasts for uh, roughly about a month after giving. So one advantage is compared to the other two, flufenazine and flufenthixol, which generally is given once in two weeks, this is given once a month. So that's one advantage. And uh, available in 50 mg and 100 mg ampules. A usual fair dose about 50 mg per month. So advantages is uh, one month administration, and the problem or the disadvantage is uh, risk of EPS and tardive dyskinesia, which is probably there with all the first generation ones. So it crosses the blood brain barrier. So tendency for EPS is very high and the plasma protein binding is about 92%. So can be used even in pregnancy. The other one which is probably mo more used among the, say the recent psychiatrists is zuclopenthixol. So again, the first generation antipsychotic dissolved in vegetable oil. It's a fractionated coconut oil. So plasma half-life is about, again, uh, two to three weeks. And uh, it comes in two forms. The advantage uh, or uniqueness about zuclopenthixol is available in two forms. You have a short-acting acuphase one, which is uh, uh, water-based. And then you have a long-acting uh, depot one, which is 200 mg one depot. So which is a longer acting, which acts for about uh, two to three weeks. So. It's available in repo forms. The cost comes to about uh, 500 rupees per injection. And uh, the short-acting one 
acts immediately for about two to three days and is preferred for acute agitation, for bipolar excitement, people who are refusing uh, to take tablets, especially in mania or schizophrenia, acute excitement. For acute control, it is generally preferred and you can give continue with the long-acting one, the depot one for uh, maintenance kind of treatment. So this is a rough chart about uh, the first generation one. You have flupenthixol, flupenzine, haloperidol and zuclopenthixol. Test dose is generally preferable. It is not uh, mandatory, but preferable because it is dissolved in oily base. People can have mild reaction, so test dose can be given and wait. you can wait for about two to three days. People have no reaction, then continue. But then, uh, till now, I have not had any pe person having, uh, say, problem with any of these drugs. So fairly okay, it is preferable to give a test dose. And uh, the usual dose range for these drugs is about zuclopenthixol 200 mg, haloperidol about 50 mg, flufenazine about 25 to 50 mg, and flupenthixol is about 20 to 40 mg, which we give. And few things which are special to each drug is flupenthixol has a, fair, a high dose range. So you have the liberty to increase the dosage and uh, can be tried even for little negative symptoms. Flufenazine and haloperidol have high risk of EPS and zuclopenthixol can be preferred for acute excitements. Coming to the second generation ones, so the first one, which is probably the first one to come to the market was Respiridone. The atypical one, it, is, it comes in microspirules. It's available in 25 mg, 37.5 mg and 50 mg. The cost roughly comes to about uh, 5,500 for about two weeks. If you are giving for two weeks, about five to 5,500. So roughly if you calculate about 10,000 or 11,000 per month, but then it looks a little big when you say 11,000 or 12,000, but per day if you calculate, it comes to about uh, say 300 or 400 rupees per day. Because you buy three, four injection, one injection is you get it free. So roughly about 300, 400 rupees per day. So generally it is better not to tell about uh, 10,000 or 11,000, the figure looks big. You say 300, 400 rupees per day, it is roughly about a cost of chicken biryani in a good hotel. So people can still afford, middle class and many of the people who have insurance and who get some reimbursement, it is still affordable. Advantage is huge. So it can be given as monotherapy, adjunctive to other uh, drugs, even in bipolar like lithium valproate where sometimes you suspect uh, uh, people may not be taking the drug and uh, uh, the advantage is you can ensure that someone is taking the drug. Side effects are very minimal and um, can be used both in schizophrenia and bipolar. So you have an option of giving, uh, the company says about two to three weeks, but then there are people who take once a month and fairly doing well. So you have an option of even giving once in four weeks also. And uh, side effects are very minimal, hardly had any problems with Respiridone 25 or 37.5 mg. And it is much lesser than even oral drug. When you give the, actually the imported uh, injections, the side effects are very less. Late rates of tardy dyskinesia is very low. And uh, only negative factor probably in our setting is the cost. Otherwise, it's, it would be actually, I mean, people would prefer Respiridone long acting and it works very well. The other one is paliperidone, which is the brother or cousin brother of respiridone. So paliperidone palmitate. So advantage again is uh, less of EPS and so on. But the major advantage over respiridone is you, it came with once a month paliperidone. And now we have once in three months paliperidone. This is available in India. Trinza, which is try once in three months, which is uh, once in three months injection. So you need to take only four injection a year. So someone comes on a vacation, you can give even for people who are going to Dubai or abroad. So they can take injection in India and go back, have a good stay there and come back and take the next, next injection here. So people, students and the working population who, who prefer not to take tablets in their place, this is uh, very much preferred. And the recent, advantage, the recent one which has come is half year, it is almost, the, it sounds like half yearly, that's why the name and it is given once in six months. So only two injections a year. So this can be given even if people are going to Europe or US. So these are the advantages with the paliperidone. The only problem is probably related to the cost. So if people get reimbursement or people who can afford, this is definitely an option. So you get pre-filled injections, uh, there is no reconstitution. And the uh, advantage is you have paliperidone oral tablet is also there. So you can give oral 
when you feel compliance is fine, you feel compliance is not okay, you can shift to injections and then again come back to oral because both are available and uh, people tolerate quite well. And you need not add any other drug because EPS is also very less. So no test dose is required dissolved in uh, water base and uh, it works almost similar to Resperidone kind of. Uh, so here is the oral tablet and uh, the roughly the equivalent of injections. So oral tablet Respiridone 2 mg is equal to Respiridone Constat 25 mg and uh, 4 mg of Respiridone tablet is roughly equivalent to the 50 mg injection. And uh, Paliperidone it is 4 mg of, 6 mg of Paliperidone is roughly about 75 mg of, pal uh, 6 mg of tablet is 75 mg of injection. So 75 and 100 is fairly quite a good dose and people have responded quite well. So the cost of all these are same. The company has, the one, uh, strategy they use these people don't increase the dose so because of the cost so they have kept the cost of 75 100 150 all the same unlike in tablets where the cost increases with the dose in injections the cost for all this is same so it doesn't matter you give 75 or 100 the cost is the same coming to the olanzapine i think this is something recent and people are using because it costs roughly about roughly about 1000 rupees so it comes uh, in 210 300 and 405 injection I have not put on the immediate release, it's only the depot which I have covered. So you can give once a month. The only probably something which is unique about uh, Olanzapine depot is the post-injection syndrome or the post-injection delirium syndrome, which is a little unique to Olanzapine. So you have equivalent of 10 mg, 15 mg and 20 mg is about 210 mg, 300 mg and 405 mg of uh, Olanzapine depot which is there. And you can give this and uh, safely be free for about a month of uh, treatment. So the advantage is uh, it's once a month. Now post-injection delirium syndrome, which is reported only with probably olanzapine, it happens more when, you, when it goes into the vasculature or it goes into the bloodstream. You purely prick it in the uh, muscle, it hardly has any major problem. So if the technique is not okay, then sometimes people can have some kind of delirium or disorientation. So generally the advice about one, uh, say one hour rest after uh, giving the injection, you watch the BP sugar and his orientation and uh, ask, look for giddiness, uh, BP and so on. If there is no problem, then uh, he is fine. Then he can go. The delirium syndrome is seen in about 3% uh, of people who have taken injection and majority are seen when the technique is not okay. So I think that can be easily be adjusted if you do the right one. Few one point or one or two slides on eripirazole. It is not available in India but then it is available abroad. Someone who is practicing uh, or wishes to practice outside India probably it is there and available in 300 mg and 400 mg injections. A unique action compared to the other uh, atypical antipsychotic, so almost similar to the tablet one. It is uh, atypical antipsychotic with the partial agonist uh, dopamine and uh, absorption bioavailability is quite good. So bioavailability with the tablet is 87% and with the IM injection is 100%. So that's the advantage of the giving injections. So eripirazole one more advantage is probably it can be used also in bipolar mania, mixed episodes and people with uh, mania, uh, mixed episodes and even with bipolar depression when you want to give an antipsychotic, people who are not willing to take tablets, this can be one of the choice. But uh, we are awaiting its ap uh, approval in India. Few LAs which probably may come in future is one is iloperidol. Trials are already going on. I think it is in phase 3 now and uh, iloperidone trial uh, LA may come in future. One more which is probably of good potential is the luracidone uh, LAIs. So you have a big list of oral tablets which are second generation and you may get it like a depot antipsychotic also. Few practical points in the end about how to use. One common question I generally ask students about what is Z-track technique. So this is what should be used when you are giving uh, all this depot antipsychotic. So I asked them where is the Z? Z is not over the top, it is inside the muscle actually. So you should actually pull the muscle and then give the injection so that after giving the injection, you leave this hand. So the injection actually is a little further and the track is seen inside the muscle as a kind of Z so that there is no spilling back. So it locks the uh, drug inside the muzzle. So because you have to give it to, to the muzzle, to the fat, 
so it helps spillage out and uh, that is the advantage of using the Z-Track technique. And a uh, few points about how to use LA's first generation, probably you can or preferably to use test dose, not mandatory. Second generation, no test dose required and uh, begin with a low dose and then slowly hike up the dose because you don't know how the person reacts. Pe people can have a bad EPS or people can have dystonia and uh, create trouble. So it is better to start with a lower dose and no hurry and slowly hike up and uh, see the response and the tolerability of the depo antipsychotic. And administer for the longest period first and then slowly come down as needed. So for example, you are giving flufenazine, you can start with once a month and then slowly make it once in three weeks or once in two weeks and so on. And um, you can watch them more frequently during the initial days of uh, giving and then slowly make it a little longer. And generally, probably someone who is drug naive, it is better not to start with the first generation initially because you don't know how the person's body reacts. Because initial days I had a major problem once when I gave zuclopentexol to a person. So I finished my practice in Kasargod. I was quite young and very enthusiastic. So person was not willing to take tablets. I asked for admission, family was not willing. So then I thought, oh, why not give a zuclopentixol injection? At least some drug will be there. I gave zuclopentixol at Kasargod and came back to Mangalore. And uh, I finished dinner. I was about to go to bed. Call came from patient's family saying, uh, person is not moving his head. So doctor, you have given that injection and now he's not moving his head. He is not able to eat. Now you have to come and correct it. So it becomes a major problem and uh, I start getting threatening calls because your injection is not moving his head. I asked him to go to the same hospital and uh, take the, another injection to get it corrected. You know which I am talking about, probably had dystonia. So I told him you go there. So we'll give the duty doctor, I will tell him to give another injection so that we'll set it all right. So they went back to the same uh, hospital to take the uh, initially, they were reluctant because they said one injection caused this. We don't want to take another injection and they have another problem. So I said, somehow convinced, you go to the doctor. I will speak to him and convince. And only once you are convinced, you come back. So middle of the night or 11 o'clock, they went to the doctor, duty doctor there. And they said, uh, his neck is not moving because of this doctor's injection. So you have to correct it. And the duty doctor was a young person who just qualified MBBS, was sitting there. and. Uh, Seeing the prescription, the relatives asked, do you know this injection? So he said, uh, I don't know, because <laughs> it was zitlopenthesol injection, so he had not really heard of it. He said, I don't know. Then they said, how can we trust that you will correct this problem because you have not heard of the injection only? We will not take the inje second injection because let the doctor, same doctor who had given the injection come. I had to drive almost about one and a half hours. It was not middle of the night. Then I said, uh, you go to another doctor, another hospital, I will convince another duty doctor to give. So somehow they went to another hospital and uh, there for my fortune or uh, luck, there was one senior duty doctor sitting there, so who retired from government service and they are quite experienced in managing, handling difficult cases. So he somehow could convince that this is because of uh, unforeseen side effect of the drug and it could be corrected. So injection promethazine was given and this dystonia improved. And uh, subsequently, they didn't come for follow-up for two, three weeks, and they didn't want to go to another doctor, scaring that uh, some serious problem, young person. So after two, three weeks, again, they came back to me saying, uh, his mania has improved. The, initially, your injection created trouble, but then after the injection, we did not take any other tablet, but he improved, uh, and uh, he was fine. So they were thankful and apologized for their, whatever, their uh, talk and so on, but then that was a learning lesson for me and after that I'm a little careful. So I don't do adventurous treatment. But then having said that, probably it works very well. Only thing is you should be a little careful when giving this and uh, it actually works wonders when you choose the right patient. Last few points on where to use about the guidelines. So all these are guidelines, American Association, Canadian Association, NICE guideline and mm -hmm. RANZAP and so on. So where to use? So they say, if patient prefers you use, that is obvious. Patient prefers depo antipsychotic, you give. But then where else to use? Partial to full non-adherence leading to recurrent relapses. That is one. So all the guidelines say almost the same thing. Avoidant of covert non-adherence is a priority. Non-adherence in multi-episode patients. Frequent relapses on oral medicines or history of problems of poor non-adherence. Despite psychosocial adherence, 
intervention, still patient has relapses, inadequate adherence. So all these guidelines say, someone is not adherent, you can try this. And almost 30% of our patients, I am sure, are non-adherent. Or they become non-adherent because of increase in symptoms. So you can prefer one. The other thing is, once you start LAIs, it doesn't mean he should be always on LAI. It, is, it can be only for a period of three months, six months, and so on. And later, you have an option of again switching to oral. Once he becomes okay and his insight improves, he's willing to take treatment, you have an option of shifting to oral also. It doesn't mean once you put him on LA, always he should be on LA. So that is one. Next point is when to give based on the period of illness. So this is first generation, second generation. Period of illness in schizophrenia and bipolar. So schizophrenia, LA, initial phase of the illness, first generation is not preferred. Second generation you can give provided it is for maintenance and there is non-adherence and risks, uh, benefits outweigh the risk, first generation. But second generation, actually if someone is affordable, you can start even in first episode. So you can give in first episode also and I have given in first episode and people do really well. So many times people are reluctant to take tablets. In for them and someone is affordable, you can give a long acting injection. You start with a low dose, it works very well. And uh, even in bipolar disorder, you don't give the first generation is not recommended. But second generation, many bipolar who are unwilling to take tablets, you can still give a second generation LA. And you have olanzapine LA. So I think the cost will not matter much if you are giving an olanzapine 300 mg or a uh, 405 mg, it will be about 1200 rupees a month, which is almost equal to a tablet. And uh, this is regarding the characteristic symptomatology and where you have, we can give uh, the LAIs. So in schizophrenia, frequent relapses, non-adherence, low insight, patient prefers significant positive symptoms because negative symptoms, it doesn't work that well, first generation ones. Cognitive deficits also you can give the second generation ones, significant positive symptoms as second line. You can also give in bipolar disorder when there is, even as a first line, when there is non-adherence, patient prefers and that choice is very less in our kind of setup. So patient preferring LA is unless you tell them because they don't know that it is available. So, and the positive experience with the depo antipsychotic you can still give in bipolar. And uh, second generation, definitely if there is a predominantly mania, rapid cycling and uh, low insight, these are the preferred uh, clinical scenarios where you can give an LA. And uh, probably the last one or two slides and uh, in bipolar disorder when to give because this is another, uh, I mean, scenario where uh, adherence is a problem and insight is poor and many people don't take maintenance treatment. So first line treatment, probably no for acute mania or depression. But then second line treatment, someone is not responding to our usual line of management. You can prefer a second line risperidone or alanzapine LAIs or in combination with the mood stabilizer. Many times because you give an LAI, I can't, I can't it works much better look. because bioavailability is better. You can ensure compliance. So you can give along with your uh, valproate or lithium, you can give a olanzapine instead of an oral tablet, you give an olanzapine LAI, you are 100% sure that he is getting the drug. So even though he uh, misses his lithium or a valproate, this is there to cover. So that's an advantage. So to conclude, so few points. Last, when selecting a specific LAI, consider the class similarities and individual antipsychotic differences. So you prefer which LAI would be better to give in a particular patient and uh, depending on the illness and the stage in which he is or the symptomatology. Individualize the dose, dosing interval based on patient response. You may not be able to adjust a uh, say olanzapine uh, 7.5 or a uh, 15 mg easily like a tablet, but then you can uh, adjust the duration. You can give it once, uh, two, once in two weeks, once in three weeks or once in four weeks to see a better response. Although some LAs are expensive, they potentially reduce the financial burden of schizophrenia and improve quality of life. This is my personal experience. Initially, I was also a little hesitant, but then after using, I felt people, once they get adjusted to this, they are very happy because they, you need not take a tablet daily. And uh, it is like coming to you on a monthly injection. You personally can give. They are more happy to take from a doctor. They are also convinced. I personally give the injection. So they are convinced someone experienced is giving. You know he is getting the tablet. And they are also happy because after going from the clinic, they need not bother about the tablet. So that's an advantage. And uh, 
Look for reasons for non-adherence and intervene accordingly. It doesn't mean always LAIC is an option. It could be a psychosocial problem and it could be many other things leading to non-adherence. So changing only the uh, root of administration may not matter. So a good psychosocial intervention also may be needed to manage non-adherence. And last, the message from to for today is when you think of options to treat schizophrenia or difficult bipolar, always think long-acting injectable antipsychotics can also be an option. So let it there be back of, back of mind and uh, probably we can help a little more patients uh, if we use this. So any questions, uh, people can mail me at uh, this address. Thank you, sir, for an enriching session. Now over to the chairpersons for the discussion. Oh, oh, with the patient who had problem, patient was zuclopenthixol. Zuclopenthixol. It is not very common, but then he, I had given for actually acute mania. I had given for acute mania and uh, young males, effective problems, the risk for uh, EPS and dystonia is quite high. So probably the choice was not right and uh, probably I did not inform the family. Looking back, the problems which, the mistakes I did was I did not inform the family of side effects. I chose the wrong patient. I should have probably covered with some kind of trixivadil or something like that. Or I would have informed the family that in case there is a problem, this is probably ha can happen, you can come back to me. So they got a little agitated because this was totally unexpected. And uh, suddenly after injection, this happens and someone is not able to turn the head. So they literally started threatening me that uh, we will see how you will practice in that particular place. So, but then uh, it got solved. So I think probably choosing the right patient, informing is, is uh, necessary. But if you ask me whether, I mean, which all antipsychotics I have used, I have used all of them. So I have all used all of them. And second generation works very well compared to the first generation ones. Only problem is affordability. As usual, this is a wonderful presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a wonderful presentation. So as the time uh, constraint, uh, only two doubts are from the audience. Before, there was a time when we uh, usually used to give uh, flu uh, flu Those days, we had a practice of giving for the first five days, uh, trihexipenidine, yes. which certainly would uh, prevent the onset of acute histone. Any any studies about the depopulation with the liver or the renal disease? Probably, I mean, all these things works equal and like oral tablets only. Whatever we the guidelines are there for oral tablets. Same guidelines. Uh, apply for uh, depo also, probably we need to reduce the dose depending on the severity of the renal or uh, liver disease and so on. So the tablet or uh, injections which tablet which we prefer during uh, the medical illnesses, what drug you plan to give, same thing can be given, applied for uh, the injectable also. So there is no separate. Only thing is bioavailability is much better with the LAs. So there is no di big difference between oral and injectable. As, pa as paliperidone is a liver friendly, so can yes, you, yeah. it can be. Only thing is with the S SGS, the second generation, the problem is the cost factor, especially our kind of population. Otherwise, it's quite good. Okay, okay thank you very much. And with this, uh, we close this session. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Madhavada, sir, to hand over the memento to the speaker. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Raj Mohan B, sir, to hand over a token of appreciation to the chairpersons.
Thank you, sir. The way in which the major psychiatric disorder manifests in children and adolescents is often a big enigma to all of us. And the next session is going to be on bipolar disorder in children and adolescents. I welcome Dr. Ashok Kumar, sir, Professor Imhans Calicut, and Dr. Lakshmi Mohan, ma'am, RMO at GMSC Calicut, uh, to chair the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. And to demystify and unravel this enigma, I would like to invite on the dais respecter Dr. Varsha Vidyadharan, ma'am, Assistant Professor, Department of Psychiatry, Calicut Medical College. Uh, Assistant Professor in Psychiatry in Calicut Medical College, she contributed a chapter in the book Suicide Prevention of Handbook for Community Gatekeeper, 2009. She received Early Career Psychiatrist Fellowship in 2015 at WPA Regional Congress, Cochin, and currently pursuing PhD in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the Kuhas, and her keen area of interest is Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. Now I hand over to the chairperson. At first, I thank uh, Dr. Sushil and his team for providing this opportunity for me. And uh, it's a nice, uh, it's a, I'm happy to chair a session with uh, Dr. Varsha, who is a former colleague and uh, who has carved a space for herself as a child psychiatrist in Corrigood. And uh, she'll be, uh, she has got her own uh, the backing of her experience. And uh, this topic, regarding the topic of bipolar affective disorders in children, and uh, it is a, the dilemma here is double dilemma because uh, even bipolar management of bipolar uh, disorder is a dilemma uh, in a clinical situation. And for children, again, uh, I think that uh, uh, child psychiatry is still a younger uh, speciality of, uh, because uh, it is still in the uh, childhood stage and it has to, it is still evolving and uh, of course uh, to we have to make a lifetime diagnosis in childhood it is very challenging and uh, especially when we are going to practice for a, a long period these patients may come back to you so again uh, some uh, making a diagnosis will be even more di difficult and uh, a diagnosis of bipolar will be difficult in childhood, especially when the patient is uh, presenting with a depressive episode. And uh, so uh, it may take, uh, the, we have to uh, deal with the compulsion to make a diagnosis. It may take, for, for a diagnosis to make, it may take some time for making a diagnosis of a bipolar disorder in a child. And, uh, my dear, I think uh, DSM-5 has come with a category, new category, uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which may address many of these problems of making a lifetime diagnosis because it is usually made in the childhood and adolescent period. So with these words, I will restrict because we are running short of time. So I will hand over to Dr. Varsha.
PBD basically refers to bipolar disorder in children below 17. And it is basically a lifelong psychiatric illness. It has significant morbidity, disability, and increased mortality. And that makes this a topic of dilemma. Now, the first dilemma starts here regarding the evolution of the concept. Was this similar to something sort of mixed mania in adult? That was the simil uh, initial thought because uh, something that happened in childhood had run a chronic course, absent disc discrete episodes. The onset was usually in chi ch childhood and adolescent. It had a high rate of suicide, poor response to treatment, and the neuropsychological deficits were, were suggestive of ADHD. So uh, thus, the concept uh, was, uh, the con uh, evolution of the concept began. Later, there were few more recommendations with few differentiating features because this type of illness had severe irritability, effective storms, and prolonged aggressive temper outburst. And these children had severe, persistent, often violent symptoms. And later it was found that there is a strong familiarity among those children with specific treatment responsivity. And they run a unique course that is non-episodic, chronic, rapid cycling, and a mixed manic state. So is it a distinct disorder? Again, a point of confusion. Now, this was uh, some useful longitudinal studies. One is PEABB, the Phenomenology and Course of Pediat Pediatric Bipolar Disorder Project, an IMH-funded project, and COBE study, which was again a multi-site project, including a larger sample, and it included a wider diagnostic stage range of youth, including bipolar 1, 2, and NOS as well. Now, the first dilemma takes us to another point of thinking. Do we actually need a separate diagnosis? Because on one side, we have the risk of uh, misapplying the diagnosis, over treating them. And on other side, we have withholding the diagnosis and under treating them. And it was often noticed that uh, many often these confusions are occurring because the diagnostic criteria or the clinical mental status examination are often not systematically applied in many clinical settings. Now, after that came up the concept of broad, intermediate, and narrow phenotypes. So, the narrow phenotype broadly means the DSM-4-TR criteria except that uh, abnormal mood has to be either elevated or expansive or grandiose. The intermediate phenotype is the one with episodes of shorter duration, but it should have a clear episodic irritability. And this broader phenotype, SMD, or the severe mood behavior dysregulation, later came up with the new concept of DMDD, about which Ashok sir was talking about. And this included children with a wide range of mood and behavior problems. But along with the abnormal mood, they should have hyperarousal. And uh, reactivity to negative stimuli should be marked for at least 12 months. So uh, later, the concept evolved to intermediate, narrow, and broader phenotype pattern. So thus, as the concept evolved, we had a number of uh, thoughts regarding the concept. Actually, do we need a separate uh, diagnostic category for them? Do we need a separate phenomenology for them? How should we place them? So that is the first clinical dilemma in this disorder. Now, the second part regarding the prevalence. Because on one side, we consider childhood mania as a rare entity. and Contrast to that finding, there are observations that up to two-thirds of adults with mania report their occurrence during childhood or adolescence. So on one side, either we are missing the diagnosis or underestimating them, or sometimes we are overestimating the prevalence. Now, 
there are risk of both false positive diagnosis and false negative diagnosis because if the diagnosis is actually false positive and the child or adolescent is actually having ADHD or depression, we are treating them with anti-manic or mood stabilizers or antipsychotics. This can go on to complications rel related to that. Now, if the child is actually having bipolar disorder and we are making a wrong diagnosis, treating them with depressants, antidepressants and stimulant medications, again, this can go on to further complications. So we have risk of both false positive and false negative diagnosis. So the decision of whether to diagnose a pediatric bipolar disorder is actually a challenging dialectic. Now this is the current data that we have. Across globe, prevalence 1% to 2%. Indian data says roughly 3 to 4%. And uh, there has been a 40-fold increase in bipolar disorder diagnosis according to US survey. Uh, nevertheless, it is the fourth leading cause of disability across globe. Now, there is variance in the prevalence. That is the dilemma because of the variance sample ages, diagnostic criteria applied, the information that we have observed, again, the conceptualization of the disorder, the effect of medication exposure, as well as the environmental stressors. Now, another concern is that in many European countries, the diagnosis usually follows ICD-10, whereas some of the US side prefers the broad-based DSM-4 or 5 criteria. So that was the second dilemma, uh, dilemma regarding the prevalence aspects. The third is regarding the diagnostic issue and category. Do we need exact category for them? If so, what are the phenomenology uh, that we do use for diagnosis of these children? The American Ap Academy of Child and Adolescents has two uh, major diagnostic concerns because uh, whether these problems being seen in youth can best be de uh, described as bipolar disorder. Is it the same mania as we see in adults? The concern there is that irritability, poor concentration and increased motor activity. These three symptoms can be seen in many different childhood disorders, right from ADHD, ODD, anxiety disorders. These three symptomatology are common in many of the common childhood disorders. Now, to clarify them further, we can go on to a spectrum approach including 1, 2, cyclothymia and the NOS category. And it is told that actually 1 is rare in youth, whereas uh, the other disorders classified as bipolar spectrum disorders and NOS are more common in the youth. Now, this is the challenge per se. Now, are we considering the developmental differences? Are we considering the cultural variations? Are we considering the distinctions between the so-called normal mood and the pathological mood? especially when go on to when we move on to the categorical diagnosis in DSM and ICD. Now how can we handle this concern? Now few points that would help us to diagnose this is the grandiosity part, decreased need for sleep, expansive or elevated mood are usually seen in around 80 percentage of cases. The hypersexuality part is usually less common and in adolescents, mania is commonly associated with psychotic symptoms, rapidly changing moods, mixed manic and depressive features. Now, irritability, mixed manic depressive features are usually common than euphoria was again substantiated in a number of findings later. So, we can use practically these four categorization. Bipolar 1, 2, cyclothymia or bipolar disorder, NOS categorization. Now, where can we use the BPD NOS categorization? When manic symptoms last for hours 
to fewer than four days and for chronic and impairing manic symptoms. Cyclothymia is actually rarely diagnosed in youth because due to the prolonged duration criteria that we need to make a diagnosis. The concern here is that it can very well overlap with the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, DMDD, because there the duration criteria is at least 12 months. Youth who clinically present with a cyclothymic presentation are more often diagnosed with BPD NOS. But actually this is a challenge for us. Now, uh, again, to categorize them, another issue that we have we sh on one side, they say, we should be very cautious while, while diagnosing this category. But on the other side, they say, there is a high chance of co-occurrence of other conditions, especially ADHD, and this can overlap the symptoms. But at the extreme opposite side, they say, early onset pediatric bipolar disorder has relatively poor prognosis, so we need to identify them at the earliest and start treatment at the earliest. So, the challenges here is that we need discrete mood episodes, we need a clear definition of cycling. So, the concerns or challenges of the duration of manic episode, the role of irritability versus euphoria, and the overlap with other illness. Now, a solution for all these problems was basically suggested from DSM 4 to 5, and they say we can utilize the category B symptoms of mania in DSM 5, and you go by clinical criteria to clarify these confusions. And DSM-5 or ICD-11, both are basically using a lifespan approach. So, uh, we don't at present have a separate category for pediatric bipolar disorder. But reading between the lines in DSM-5 and ICD-11, uh, we will understand that the lifespan approach, although they say the onset of illness as is usually in the early adolescence. Now, these are uh, some good reads for this uh, area, uh, topic for uh, those who are interested. Now, this is the fourth clinical dilemma regarding the cause and outcome because these children spend more time symptomatically ill, especially in the mixed states or with rapid cycling and subsyndromal symptoms and they have very severe behavioral disruption. Now, uh, Comorbidities in pediatric bipolar disorder, uh, 60 to 90 percentage have comorbid ADHD, 70 percentage have comorbid anxiety disorder. So are these due to the overlap in diagnostic criteria or uh, are these due to the uh, functional impairment and difficulty in diagnosing, uh, diagnosis due to the coexistence of various disorders? Now, if I say that there are comorbidities and it is as high as 70 percentage or 76 percentage ODD, contact disorder, substance abuse disorder, we have various options for this comorbidities. One possibility is that both disorders have few common risk factors, for example, like ADHD. Now, the second option is that one disorder is a risk factor for the other. For example, ADHD, anxiety, disruptive behavior disorder, or substance use disorder. Now, the third possibility is that the, this is basically a nosological artifact. That is, either an iatrogenic comorbidity overlooked prodromal signs of bipolarity. That is, ADHD, anxiety, or disruptive behavior disorder. So, uh, considering the comorbidities in pediatric bipolar disorder is actually a dilemma. Now, let us try to resolve these dilemmas. Some red flag signs are the early onset depression, especially with psychotic features, if there are episodic aggressive behavior, family history of bipolar disorder, atypical depression with hypersomnia, increased appetite, and severe interpersonal rejection sensitivity, the chances of early onset bipolar disorder are more. 
Now, uh, to resolve the dilemmas, another approach is to go on to the core aspect of diagnosis, uh, uh, reliable and sensitive history taking and complete structured mental status examination whereby we identify the discrete episode, features associated with mania or depression, excluding the typical developing child experience in a particular situation, developmentally appropriate fantasy, and a distinct change from child's usual level of function. At the same time, look for other manic symptoms, and we need a longitudinal approach, data from multiple informants and teachers, and usually we need to see the child repeatedly over time and uh, rating scales diagnostic interviews standardized observations are useful although we don't have very well validated rating scales that are sensitive or specific to BD in children now the research diagnostic criteria whenever we use again they have few difficult difficulties because how each interviewer use those criteria in each particular interview parent reported general behavior interview this is uh, this was found to be a useful tool uh, to pick up few of the signs now while assessing Please note that comorbidity is actually the rule rather than the exception in childhood bipolar disorder as we have seen earlier. Now, we can differentiate manic symptoms from ADHD and ODD because the elevation, uh, the elation is episodic and irritability is also usually episodic. The need for sleep is actually uh, a useful sign with grandiosity, hyperactivity and distractibility usually episodic. And whenever we diagnose comorbidities, please make sure that the child is not in active phase of mood disorder. Only when in youth IVA in remission go for diagnosing the comorbidities. Now, if it is classical bipolar disorder, if the child is having either anxiety or sleep disorder, sleep problems, usually the depressive disorder and hypomanic symptoms are episodic and later they may move on to bipolar disorder. Whereas the so-called DMDD, DMDD is the new uh, byproduct of DSM-5, uh, usually there the child might have developmental disorders or ADHD, there is a chronic mood dysregulation. This is the useful pointer for DMDD. Chronic irritable mood with a negative effect lasting for at least 12 months. The child shouldn't be symptom free for at least 3 months during the last 12 months. That is the key pointer. And usually they are seen to progress to mood dysregulation and depression which is usually unipolar by the time they are to early adulthood. In fact, this was the reason cited by DSM-5 team for the um, uh, uh, reason for this particular consideration of DMDD in DSM-5. Now, uh, treatment part is again another uh, dilemma, but uh, in order to resolve that, we can very well set the goals as to reducing the symptoms, educating about the illness, promote adherence, and promote normal growth and development. It should be comprehensive, multimodal, uh, uh, including the psychopharmacology and psychosocial therapies. By psychosocial, I mean a combination of CBT, IPSRT, uh, family-focused psychoeducation, and proper family support and follow-up. It should be definitely tailor-made with an, an, a definite understanding of chronic nature of the disorder, age of the child, and family environment. Now, the, as if now, we don't have any particular strong evidentiary support molecule for this particular disorder, but we need to focus on the symptom or the most disabling part of bipolar disorder. Is it mania, depression, psychosis, substance abuse, or suicidality? So, the algorithm here is, you can either initiate with any antimanic agent, 
first lines are lithium valproate carbamazepine risperidone olanzapine quetiapine if you get a full response continue maintenance treatment and then you can proceed to step 2 that is assess for the comorbidities if there is only a partial response go for augmentation with second antimanic agent how is it reevaluate the response if there is no response or not tolerated switch to another antimanic agent now treatment with mood stabilizers actually improvement is slow to develop and uh, usually frequent relapses are noticed in this group uh, the good response among the mood stabilizers is again for lithium and uh, lithium as uh, mohanindran sir was rightly pointing out it is the time tested molecule in the child and adolescent population as well although few rcts are not that much supporting for them and valproate again has few of the evidences uh, carbamazepine has also few supportive studies especially if the child is having mental retardation uh, depression adhd comorbid adhd and psychotic symptoms and this molecule didn't found, found to have much of the improvement regarding as a role as a mood stabilizer lamotrigine as mohanindran sir was uh, rightfully pointing out again evidence support is good uh topiramate few off label reports are supporting us and with off label use for tourettes and prader willi syndrome now antipsychotics are uh, very good uh, supporters for us with risperidone uh, olanzapine and uh, the average time to optimal response was 1.9 to 1 month of therapy and this is actually a lifestyle modifying regime as well they need to have a diet exercise a regular life uh, life changing modification as well along with the uh, regular follow up with the treating psychiatrist and the team now the rate of the switch is again another concern Re switch from prepubertal depression to mania uh, is very well reported and Uh, how can we distinguish bipolar from unipolar depression especially when we are seeing the index episode they say that you treat what you are seeing but if the child is having a strong family history high rates of psychosis anxiety disorder substance use disorder adhd and few personality issues have a, a vigilant thinking in your mind especially when he or she is having a comorbid psychiatric disorders of multiple types and comorbid cd again is a that there is a chance of bipolarity going on in future and greater severity in both quantity and quality of depressive symptoms is again a pointer for bipolar depression poor relationship with peers and family high incidence of problems at school especially scholastic deviance presenting to us there may be a chance for bipolar depression now uh, BDNOs compared to one or two usually takes longer time to recover and their symptoms recur sooner and uh, 80 percentage will experience at least one recurrence in the following 2 to 5 years so how long you should treat them uh, as if now we don't have a clear cut years to point out uh, i tried searching in many of the articles but the reason cited is the ch high chance of recurrence for uh, in in the sequential years now this was the cobby study which was earlier pointed out and uh, 50% age had a rapid cycling course 80% age failed to attain functional remission or euthymia over a course of 10 year now if the child is having an early age of onset with longer duration of illness with low socio economic status mixed symptoms or rapid cycling psycho psychosis sub syndromic symptoms comorbid disorders especially exposure to negative life events and fa family psychopathology the chance of prognosis is poor and that is again a challenge for us so to sum up the challenges for the present and future regarding pbd is that it is an impairing illness it cycles frequently chance that affected children are symptomatic much of lifetime we need definitive assessment to avoid inconsistencies between epidemiological and clinical sample 
we need long term prospective studies which are actually in early stages of seeing how pbd is developing into adults we don't have a single risk gene or a matrix of risk factors which are clinically applicable we are continuing a search for bio, bio behavioral mar markers and we need a comprehensive treatment approach because the needs are actually complex we need to address the comorbidities as well novel treatment approaches beyond the traditional ones including the cognitive remediation focusing on the frontal temporal areas are ongoing and let's be optimistic for that thank you thank you ma'am for the awesome session now over to the chairpersons for the discussion It is a nice presentation from uh, Dr. Varsha. Now, we don't have much time, and uh, I would uh, request you to restrict uh, questions from the four or two questions, and uh, be brief also. I will hand over to uh, Dr. Lakshmi for her comments. Any questions? differentiate between the normal uh, growing up issues of adolescent you be always explain that that is a time of pruning and a lot of behavioral issues are there which you explain as adolescent turmoil and uh, cultural factors whether all cultures perceive it as whether the indian culture is more you know we let go americans may not uh, do that is that the reason why their diagnosis actually uh, the differentiating elements cited are one is the duration and how much it is functionally impairing for the child in the personal interpersonal and the academic and the various uh, social zones and in basic biological functions daily activities of life in the various aspects of the uh, uh, the nature of the works that the child do uh, in, in the normal developmental and cultural area, they say, although it makes issues on and off, the functioning is not that consistently impaired. And you go by clinical assessment uh, sequentially with the diagnostic criteria per se. That is one of the solutions suggested. Any more questions? As Sir said, child psychiatry, especially in Kerala, is in a toddler stage. And uh, nowadays, the uh, increased incidence of substance use among adolescents have much more complicated the picture. Already existing ADHD and mood disorder diagnosis dilemma. So, ma'am, just with one doubt, I will uh, we'll wind up the session. The common question while treating any childhood uh, pediatric or adolescent thing will be uh, parental concern of how long. Uh, so the first thing is to psychoeducate the parents regarding the need for treatment. And even if they, that is addressed, the next question will be that. So if it is uh, diagnosed and started, um, so the parents' common question will be on how long the treatment. So unless we address that, we won't be able to move forward with that. So please. One uh, option is to go by the classical uh, approach. That is for the index episodes, we can uh, stabilize the patient first and then uh, continue for six to nine months. We can go by that way. But uh, at least in personal experience, whenever either by meticulous treatment we step down and stop, recurrence is a, a significant matter of concern because uh, uh, to all of the patients that we see, the situation is familial. Very often it is not sporadic. So keep them in uh, confidence. Take them with you. <laughs> Express your insecurities and inadequacies. Treat them as much as possible. That would be my sincere approach. So thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful session. Thank you all. So, before winding up, just one question. Uh, 
so what is the is there any consensus or any guidelines about making the earliest age at which you can make a diagnosis of bipolar depression in children and uh, about starting mood stabilizers like lithium in childhood is there any cut off date uh, sir, uh, PBD is less than 70. That age that they have fixed. Lower age has not been fixed. At least I have not seen. I, okay. I search for them a lot. Now, uh, regarding the molecule, uh, literature says many molecules are about 12. Uh, lithium, valproate, okay. or many molecules. But we know we are starting all those molecules very early. Uh, so, uh, we are uh, actually unable to fix a lower age for that. Uh, now, the prescriber guidelines have saying few lower age limits, especially in case of antipsychotics. I think now we can wind up the session and dispose for lunch, is it? No. It's okay. It's Thank okay. you, ma'am. Okay. No. I, would I would like to request Dr. Ashok Kumar, sir, to give the memento to the speaker. And I request Dr. Ashok Kumar sir to kindly remain on the dais that you are uh, chairing the next session too. And I would request Dr. Sushil Kakin sir to hand over a token of appreciation to the chairpersons. Thank you sir. Next session is on a clinical scenario, we frequently encounter in our clinical practice, but yet there exist lots of myths and un misunderstandings. To chair this session on psychotropics in pregnancy and lactation, I would like to invite Dr. Ashok Kumar sir and Dr. Nikhil Liu, assistant, uh, sir, assistant professor, Calicut Medical College. Thank you, sir. To give us the much sought after answers to these question, questions, I invite our very own erudite professor, Dr. V. Rajmohan, sir, onto the dais. Uh, sir is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry in KM City Medical College. Sir did it under graduation and post-graduation from Government Medical College, Calicut. Nearly did 67 publications with 1,127 citations. He did uh, 130 CME talks and is a joint winner in IAPP Best Research Paper Award in 2016. Sir's keen area of interest is in psychopharmacology and biological psychiatry. Now I hand over to the chairperson. Good afternoon. So uh, this session is going to be an interesting one. It's a very useful one. And I think there are many challenges in this area. Let's hear from Dr. Raj Mohan. He don't need any introduction. He's my batch mate. And I hand over the mic to Raj Mohan. Good afternoon. I'm separating you from lunch, and I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Uh, here, it was already discussed that this is an area of great dilemma, uh, and Shakespeare has been quoted much. Here, the challenge is not to give or not to give. The challenge is to take or not to take, which means our role has changed from being a prescriber to being an informal. And the decision is being made by the patient or any person who's got the capacity to make the decision. We are just giving information. This is now the line of litigious practice. Now, briefly, just to start off with the facts. Okay, around 50% pregnancies are unplanned. So most scenarios, we'll get patients who are on psychotropics who will report with a pregnancy. The most important two things which we have to bear in mind are a major congenital anomaly can occur at any point in time without any medication or intervention or without uh, advanced maternal age in 2 to 4 percent. So we are starting from a baseline risk of 2 to 4 percent. Any risk above this, which is significant, alone can be attributed to a drug. And the same is with miscarriages. 
Miscarriages happen spontaneously in 15 to 20 percent, which is not attributable to any other factors, probably genetic. Now, all available drugs will close the placental barrier, usually by simple diffusion. And the interesting fact, of course, we know is that there is no FDA-approved drug in pregnancy. And with a lot of drugs, data is still emerging. So we can't say any categorical data as to with which we can proceed with any drug. Now, there are three areas which we'll be focusing on, but I'll be focusing on only one area basically because I have to cover lactation also. The major problem we will face is structural teratogenicity, which means if there is a chance of a major organ malformation. And this is the area where there is a lot of guidance. The other guidance is with perinatal syndrome, whether the child is going to have a failure to thrive, either a hypotonia, mm -hmm. hypotonia, rigidity, uh, increased sleep or feeding difficulty. There are guidances on this, but I will not be covering that in detail. The area where we have absolutely no data is behavioral teratogenicity. If you give the drug now, is the drug going to cause a behavioral problem in the child later? This is an area where we have absolutely no studies, absolutely no details. Now, what are the, regarding the structural teratogenicity, which I'll be focusing on, it's the first 12 weeks of gestation which we are really bothered about. And as I said earlier, the risk is significant only if there's a baseline risk above which it actually causes teratogenic effect. And the baseline risk for a major congenital anomaly, as mentioned, is 2 to 4 percent. And for a minor defect, is roughly around 7 to 10 percent. There are other pitfalls which I'll actually mention later. Now, regarding drugs and teratogenicity, we have got this FDA classificatory system, which actually puts it into categories called A, B, C, D, and X. A is where you can actually pretty much safely give the drug basically because there are enough studies to support that it is not going to cause harm. B is where there are studies which have failed to demonstrate um, teratogenicity in animals, but what happens with control studies in human beings is lacking. In C, we have got animal studies which actually show adverse effects to the fetus, but there are no adequate trials or very well controlled trials in human beings. D is where there's a positive evidence of human risk in both human studies and animal studies, but then the problem here is that we have to look for the risk-benefit ratio. Even though the risk is pretty much evident, if the risk is less than the benefits, we can actually give the medication. Or benefits outweigh the risk. And category X, especially after the thalidomide tra tragedy, is the area where the definite risk is far above the benefits. And these drugs cannot be given. Now, this is what we had till recently. Now, the change in approach is that FDA now recognizes that many cases you will have to give medications to pregnant women. A classical scenario will be something like epilepsy. So now they are moving towards a discussed option. They are moving towards trying to give medications because withholding them will have serious effects. And now they are trying to say that it is better to give accessible, understandable information to the pregnant woman and then we can reach a consensus on to whether we should start the drug. And that is why they have started the pregnancy and lactation labeling rule. This is a final ruling which has actually come in and from June 30, 2015, you will not find any drugs with a category A, B, C, D or X. All, them, all of them will have certain sections and subsections mentioning the major problems that you're going to face. And slowly, they are trying to phase in all drugs which have been approved after June 30, 2001 into this. But any drug prior to that will still hold the A, B, C, D and X. Now what are the different sections and subsections? Subsections will, for every drug, this is a 8 one in your package insert, will have a pregnancy section which will take care of labor and delivery, a lactation section and a proposed section on female and male reproductive potential. Most drugs now do not have any re details regarding their reproductive potential and even the, with any drug which has come uh, as of now, carry present for example, it does not have the third section. 
these sections will be added on in the future as more and more data comes, comes in. Now, pregnancy section will have, the first thing is, after information, if the patient is going to take the medication, they actually can join the pregnancy, pregnancy exposure registry. There's a pregnancy exposure registry which should be clearly accessible. And if you look at the package insert, they will actually give you the website to which you can go and you can actually see what are the available info regarding that drug in pregnancy that is available till that point in time. And any person who is actually starting to take the drug can be actually enrolled into the registry. The thing that every drug insert should have is a risk summary. The risk summary is the summary that is available from all the phase 3 information and available post-marketing trial information which is clearly written into the package insert. Clinical considerations are ex uh, explanations on this and data is all the studies which have actually led to this. So, for an example, and uh, another thing is that in many cases you will, may not find the clinical consideration or data summary basically because that has not been clearly understood. So, some, some cases it might be actually deleted. Now, this is for example in cariprism. So, cariprism, the first thing you'll show, it'll show is the trial that is going on or the registry that is there. This is the registry is actually the National Pregnancy Registry for Atypical Antipsychotics. You can actually click in and you can actually look into the registry and find out information for every specific drug that is there in the market. The second part is actually the risk summary. This actually gives what is the risk perinatally, what is the risk in animals. These are rabbit trials and rat trials that have been given. And it actually ends by giving the baseline risk, the 2 to 4 and 15 to 20. That is very clearly mentioned. So this risk summary will be there for every drug. Clinical consideration, which is actually uh, what is going to happen usually uh, perinatally and what happens in the early trimester. For cariprism, early trimester information is very poor. But uh, towards delivery, they have noticed agitation, hypotonia, hypotonia, etc. So that is very clearly written. The data sheet is the animal data and the human data. It's a huge sheet. I've just taken one part of it. So these are the things which you, which you can expect. And as said, the fertility information is not there for carry present because it's not available. The same holds good for lactation. There is a risk summary, there is a clinical consideration, and there is a data sheet. And what are the information that they are trying to provide in future? Now they are trying to provide in future the pharmacokinetics of the data in the infant. The trials, uh, will, data will come much later. A risk benefit section regarding lactation and also when to time the breastfeeding. These are not currently available for any drug that is coming into the market, but it is expected in the future. And this is what you have for cariprism, for example. It just says that lactation studies have not been done. Cariprism is present in rat's milk. That is a basic information. It does not say what is the pharmacokinetics of caricolas in a child, what is actually going to happen, what is the risk, what is the benefit. Nothing is being mentioned. Probably it will come in the future. Now, this is another area, uh, the female and male reproductive potential. This section is not present in any of the packages because information is being collected. So when to do a pregnancy testing, what contraception should be there, for which drug, is it mandatory, stuff like that. What, how does it affect the fertility? All these will be probably added in the future, but currently you may not be able to find it anywhere. Now, coming to whether or not to offer a drug. You offer, they take. Whether you have to offer starts with the baseline risk. Is there a risk of mental illness to, or mental illness being untreated to the fetus? Of course, we know that a person with mental illness has got poor self-care, poor judgment. So they might end up with poor dietary um, uh, the poor dietary adherence, they might have poor obstetric care and they can be impulsive events like suicide, all of which directly bears on the feet. So there is a baseline risk and above baseline illness risk. Both has to be taken care of and of course when it comes to uh, postpartum there is a definite risk of um, infanticide which might actually be present. So. It, it is not just treating a child, pregnant woman with a mental illness to prevent the risk antepartum. It is also to, to prevent the risk postpartum. So there is a baseline risk. Above that, there are good studies in bipolar which actually shows that 
bipolar itself, if untreated, there is an increase of low birth weight, there is decreased fetal growth and postnatal complications. These are bipolar patients who have not taken medications. And also there is an increased level of catecholamines and cortisol. There is infant crying, that is uh, in unconsolable crying. And there is actually an increased rate of admission above baseline in NICU for a pregnant lady, a child who has not been on medications. This is basically a drug, a bipolar patient without any drug exposure still has a risk. Now this is another risk assessment pitfall which will happen. Many minor physical anomalies can be present as part of the illness itself. We are all aware of the minor physical anomalies that can be present in schizophrenia. And many of them can actually be apparent at birth. So this is another area which we'll have to address. Is this minor physical anomaly due to the drug? Is it due to the primary psychotic or primary mood illness which is actually causing this? So this might actually interfere with our final judgment. So we've got a baseline risk. We have got a risk that is due to the illness and we have got a risk that is probably genetically or an endophenotype of the condition. Now, if you're going to discuss with the patient what you're going to do, probably you'll start with the impact of the mental illness per se. How an untreated mental illness is going to affect your uh, unborn child. Now, if the person is already on drugs, please talk about the risks of abruptly stopping the medication because it's always going to be pretty critical. You'll have to talk about the background risk and other risks like uh, the minor physical anomalies, if there's an advanced maternal age, all these have to be actually talked into because these, were, these are risks which we probably uh, do not actually consider. Now, when you are talking about risk of stopping the medication, one area we'll have to be very careful about is a previous episode. If the previous episode was severe, it was suicidal, then it is a discussion which needs much more weightage. You'll have to say very clearly that stopping a medication probably will have more risk than benefits. And the response to treatment is one reason why you'll have, my, you may consider actually putting the patient on drug or offering the patient drug. And of course, finally, it goes to the preference of the patient. Now, if you have decided, if they have decided, or before they decide on drug treatment, we'll have to talk about the baseline risk. And then we'll have to talk about the risk above baseline. The risk above baseline I'll discuss in the few slides. And of course, you can offer non-pharmacological treatment if it is available with a competent authority. And we know how competent our authorities are. Now, breastfeeding, it's best to actually give pack, uh, the clear package information, a written sheet or something like that. That will be helpful. Now, coming to the above baseline risk, which exists for the different classes of drugs. With respect to antipsychotics, typical antipsychotics, all of them are in category C. But again, if you, um, and most of them, and all of them will stay in category C because all of them came before 2000. And haloperidol and trifluoperacin. I've highlighted it basically because if you look at the data across the board, a typical antipsychotic with high potential has got a lower risk of major congenital anomalies. A low potency antipsychotics like lorpromazine might have a higher risk of congenital anomalies. Now coming to other drugs, there is one category B drug and that is clozapine. And any patient on clozapine, now NICE actually recommends that it should be clearly continued on clozapine. There's absolutely no point of decreasing it. And this is something which we can advocate pretty strongly. But regarding the question on putting somebody on clozapine, just for the pregnancy is a gray area. Now, with the other drugs, all of them are category C. Pretty good evidence with olanzapine and Qtipin. The only problem is with Resperidone, but again, it's not a major risk. It is slightly above what you take us to uh, 2 to 4, it's 5.3%. So this is the only drug which actually actually comes down the ladder in pregnancy. So you can consider olanzapine, Qtipin, or Aripiprazole. And with the lack of data in Ziprazidone and the lack of availability of the drug, uh, it seems a safe option, but largely not prescribed. So olanzapine. Qtipin and aripiprazole are pretty safe, but with Respiridone, there's a slightly higher risk. Now coming to the other drugs, these are NA actually means not assigned. It's not, avail no, it's not, not available. Iloperidone has not been assigned, but there is some developmental toxicity, but no teratogenicity. Paliperidone, 
even though it's nine hydroxy resveratrol, which we like resveratrol, they have not given the data, and it's a, uh, not uh, it's not available. Luracidon, it used to be category B, but now with the newer labeling, it is now not available, and you have to look at the data. But pretty much all data shows that there are there is no teratogenicity. Cariprasin, uh, early evidence. Asinapin, early evidence. With respect to blonanserin, amisulpran, and zotepin, these are not FDA approved, so there is no guidance. If there is no drug is not FDA approved, they are not going to publish any of the data. Now coming to mood stabilizers, all of the classical mood stabilizers are category D, and valproate is probably the one which is most risky, especially in combination with other medications. If a valproate polytherapy or polypharmacy is present, uh, Lancet uh, codes so that the risk may go all the way up to something like 15 to 20 percent. So that is a drug which preferentially is avoided. With respect to others, it is a cry, it is a call between risk and benefit. Lamotrigine is probably safe. Uh, Oxcarbazepine is probably safe because of it being category C. Uh, with respect to topiramate and gabapentin also, there are only few reports, but it's still category C and it's not likely to change. Now with respect to lithium, we all know that Epstein's anomaly is the concern. And there's a 400-fold risk of Epstein's anomaly. That is above a baseline risk of something like 0 0.005 to 0 0.1 per uh, uh, point, point zero zero one, uh, zero 0.01. And it usually occurs in the f period of two to six weeks post-conception. And the absolute cardiac risk is 1.2 to 7.7 .7 times. So the cardiac risk is definitely elevated. So it is a very difficult call to make. And the other problem giving lithium is, in pregnancy, is the fact that the dosage has to be titrated very carefully. In the initial part, because of the fact that there is increased clearance, lithium gets cleared. So the plasma level may actually come down. Towards the end of pregnancy, especially with the loss of uh, water, there is a loss of, uh, he, there is a hemoconcentration that happens towards the end. Lithium may start rising very suddenly. So towards the end of pregnancy, we need to monitor lithium much more closely. They say at weekly, monthly monitoring should be present. So lithium has its own difficulties, but then if you need to continue it, you probably will have to continue it, and that is based on our discussion. Now, lamotrigin, it's said to be safe, but I've put this slide just to highlight one major point, that 647, this is a Lancet study, which said that 647 lamotrigin exposures were studied, and that anomalies was 3.2% for a category C drug. And the category D drug, carbamazepine, over 900 exposures had only 2.2%. So there is an inherent fallacy there. Lamotrigine is said to be safer, but data shows that carbamazepine is probably equally safe. But one is category D and one is category C. This is again one argument why the categorization should be given up for information. Now, these are the newer AEDs, AEDs but all of them are category C and none of them are mood stabilizers. Antidepressants, all of them are a category C except maprotillin. Maprotillin is not available, it is category B. And they are really, uh, largely safe, especially good data is present with imipramine and nortriptyline and they can be given. Now coming to the SSRIs, I'll discuss this in two different areas. One is the early congenital anomalies, or MCA propensity. As Dr. Jitu was saying, paroxetin is probably the drug which we'll have to hold back. It is only category D drug in SSRIs because of the risk of ventricular septal defects. While the rest are pretty much okay. And probably sertraline uh, um, and acetylopram, the most commonly prescribed drugs, are pretty safe. And fluoxetin is also relatively safe. But the problem will come with SSRIs not in the initial weeks but in the later weeks. That I'll discuss soon. Now, bupropion, earlier it used to be a category B drug, but now it is a category C drug. And this might actually, again, uh, be due to some stray reports, but it's said to be relatively safe. While the others are all category C, Vilazidon, it's a new drug which is actually, it is not assigned a category, but it, uh, the limited data actually shows that it should be somewhere in the category C. MAOI, avoid if possible because there is a relative risk of a major congenital anomaly around 3.4 times normal. It's not 3.4 percent. 
Now, the problem with SSRIs is not just a MCA. The problem is the risk of persistent pulmonary hypertension in the newborn child. And this happens not in the initial first, to 12, we first 12 weeks, but later on. It actu actually occurs around week 20 or later. And the risk of persistent pulmonary hypertension across SSRIs is an adjusted odds ratio, ratio of 2.1. And if you look at the major offender, here again the major offender is paroxetine, which has got a very high risk. But when it comes to acetylopram, if the risk is 1.2 at the baseline, acetylopram's total risk is just 1.3. So probably that is the safest in terms of if you have, if you have a concentration of persistent pulmonary hypertension. And the next safest probably is fluoxetine. Sertral is also relatively safe. Citlopram is also relatively safe. Anxiolytics, busperone is a category B drug. And there is absolutely nothing in, in literature further from that point in time, even with the latest package insert to study, uh, state that it has gone to C. While all other drugs except clonazepam are category D. So if you want to give a benzo, probably the safer one will be clonazepam. And with the drugs like etizola and tofisopam, again, these are not FDA approved, so there is no guidance. Triexafenidyl, promethazine, and procyclin, I'm just mentioning for the sake of completion, all are category C drugs. Now, the problem here is that there are a lot of lay literature, nowadays we call it Google, uh, which misinforms pregnant women about teratogenicity. And Physicians also might be actually misled in many cases. They might inform that they need to discontinue the pregnancy. And this is a study way back in 1998 which said that a lot of women have actually undergone abortion for indications where the pregnancy, very much wanted pregnancies, um, could have been continued. So physician unawareness is a very major crisis for us. So we will have to work with them very clearly. So. Ideally, if the person is, on, is in the, uh, preg uh, is in the uh, fertile period, you should actually start giving uh, prenatal counseling three months before. This is what uh, the consensus uh, um, guideline says. And our job is just to elicit an informed decision. So we have moved from the dilemma of whether to give or not to give from to give the information and it's for them whether to take or not to take. And there should be a proper liaison between with the obstetrician and the physician. We should not be giving contradictory information. Now, this is the most important part, proper record keeping. We have to inform, we have to write it down because that is the only thing that is going to help us when we stand somewhere we really don't, do not want to stand. And the treatment during pregnancy some guidelines say it should be avoided if possible in the first trimester. And severe illness, that itself is not a consideration. Even first trimester you may have to treat. And minimal effective dose and monotherapy, common sense logic. Now coming to lactation, basic facts are 600 to uh, 1 liter of milk is present and 3 to 5 percent has emulsified fat and lipophilic drugs freely pass into the breast milk. And what are the drugs which actually pass? The drugs which are in the intravascular compartment, the drugs which are not protein bound, the drugs which are unionized or non-ionized, and which have got a very small molecular size. Just to show it in a diagrammatic format. Now, effect on the neonate actually depends on a few factors. What is the pharmacokinetics in the mother? So if it's a long half-life drug, across the feeding period, it will actually be present and that might actually freely go into it. What is the distribution to the milk, which is the milk plasma ratio? Ideally, it should be low. And what is the timing of the drug? So depending on the timing of the drug, if it's a BD drug, higher risk of exposure when compared to a OD. Now, the same thing goes to the timing of the breastfeeding. Again, there is no consensus on when to time the breastfeeding. Um, an American Journal of Psychiatry article a few years back said that if you're giving it as a dose in the night, it's best to actually feed, then take the medicine. And then 
two hours probably is safe basically because most drugs have a five hour pre-plasma ratio and then you give two feeds which are formula feeds and then again switch to breast milk but again it's not very practical advice because many drugs have different peak plasma levels or time to peak plasma now the other thing is pharmacokinetics in the child and pH and protein content of the milk the, those will determine how much of it is going to affect the child now the milk plasma ratio is important what is the maternal plasma concentration and how much of it translates to breast milk so ideally it should be less than one and the total dose should be less than 10 percent of the maternal dose and based on that there is a Hales classification it's not widely used but then it is a practical guidance it again is like the FDA classification into five levels where the first level has failed to demonstrate any risk the second level is data is limited but it is safe um, and the third level is minimal adverse effect fourth level positive evidence but risk to benefit should be considered and fifth level is like your category X significant documented risk don't give at all now this is just to show what is a PLLR which I have already discussed now coming to the different drugs typical antipsychotics again are L2 or L3 they are not contraindicated again the same rule applies high potency though there is a risk of EPS are preferred and better tolerated than low potency now the major problem is the drug that is maximally safe in pregnancy close up in is almost really a problem when it comes to lactation because the milk plasma ratio in the, on day one is 4.3 and the first week is 2.8 and there is a risk of potential agranulocytosis in the newborn so preferably it is kept aside olanzapine is probably safe and the drug which we are very conservative in we're said to be conservative or recommended to be conservative respiridone is probably the safest in lactation so it switches around uh, quetiapine is said to be safe, erpiprazole there is no recommendation but uh, recent data actually shows it's safe but I have not put it because these are based on uh, smaller trials. Lithium it is said it's better to avoid when possible but if you have to give it you can uh, you have to monitor very carefully because it's almost 5 to 200 percent uh, ratio it's a huge uh, range that is present. Valproate and carbamazepine the American Academy of Pediatrics actually says that you it is safe and you can actually need you just need to monitor the child while the person is uh, while the child uh, breast milk is being given so it's relatively safe lamotrigin again this again is a flip side lamotrigin is safer in pregnancy it should be avoided in lactation the others uh, are not really mood stabilizers when coming to antidepressants TCA is relatively safe the only problem is with doxepin you can actually um, um, so, um, it's, it's very clear because it's very very low ratios usually but these are not MP ratios they're basically concentrations 0.3 to 1.9 when the concentration should be less than 10 venlafaxin and uh, duloxetine and desvenlafaxin uh, are pretty much safe based on the ratios but it goes slightly above for venlafaxin up to 7.3 but again it is below 10 duloxetine is safe and may be used and mirtazepine is also safe Coming to SSRIs, safest probably I think is sertraline because the concentration is pretty low and paroxetine is also safe, acetylopram is also safe, slightly less preferred will be uh, fluoxetine but that doesn't mean fluoxetine cannot be given. Now the consensus statement is that milk plasma ratio for all SSRIs are below 1 and infant plasma concentration is very low so there have been multiple trials multiple metanalytic evidence which actually shows multiple trials uh, that actually shows that breastfeeding and SSRIs are not mutually exclusive so the, the data with all these drugs are pretty good and even nortriplin and vipramin the data is pretty good anxiolytics this is where we run into a bit of a problem because most of them are uh, L3, L4 uh, and pretty much you have to be used with caution. The rule of thumb you can follow is with half-life and lorazepam is probably safest when comp compared to diazepam or 
uh, clonazepam because it has got a short half-life. This is the one thing which can be given. Uh, short half-life means it's a lesser risk drug, lesser chance that it will affect the newborn child. When it comes to just giving a sedative, Zolpidem is pretty fine. And there is an American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation which says that it is compatible with breastfeeding. Not so with Zaliplon or Zopiclon. Now, what should we actually be doing? So, we have to discuss the advantages, possible side effects, discuss the timing. You can use the American uh, Journal of Psychiatry guidance. You have to tell them very clearly that antidepressants are safe. Valproate and carbamazepine are safe and there is a clear recommendation. Avoid lithium, avoid lamotrigine if possible. Definitely, probably avoid clozapin, but all other antipsychotics are pretty safe. Use benzodiazepine sparingly. If you want, you can use um, a short half-life one like lorazepam. Oxazepam, the data is not available. That's why I've not put it there. Zolpidem is considered to be safe. So in summary, you have to discuss the need for the medication. You have to discuss the safety. Most important, keep proper records and start with a minimal effective dose and prefer monotherapy. So that, I think, summarizes in a nutshell what I wanted to communicate. I thank, my, uh, th thank Dr. Sushil sir for insisting that I present. I wanted to <laughs> stay out of this because it would be a very um, bad exercise in self-promotion. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful session. I uh, humbly invite the chairs back onto the dais. Uh, before going to the discussion, just a brief announcement. Um, after this discussion, we will have the lunch. Um, so after lunch, um, 30 minutes shop, we will have a session, uh, a little short session on uh, stress management with a focus on mindfulness um, techniques. So uh, it will be lightweight session, okay, more fun and interactive, I hope. And uh, the session, the session will be. It's designed to be exclusively for the postgraduate students. So uh, those who wish to stay can stay back. And uh, uh, if you were worried about your traveling uh, problems, and uh, we are actually, uh, we will actually, uh, we'll arrange a um, traveler um, uh, vehicle to take you back to the town uh, after the session. Thank you. So back to the chairs. I have to compliment Dr. Sushil also for um, uh, insisting on Raj Mohan speaking this topic because of, the, of all the topics which we have discussed, this is the most uh, difficult and uh, delicate issue which can haunt a psychiatrist for his uh, life ethically and sometimes even legally. So, and Dr. Raj Mohan has taken great pains to give a very clear description going into the all minute details, and it was a very valuable presentation. Uh, so, uh, uh, he has uh, covered everything in, uh, in a beautiful way. So, uh, one problem which we face is that uh, all re women in the reproductive age in our part, having a mental illness is at risk because Many of our patients are having their husbands abroad. And we don't know, and once we start treatment, and they may not be coming, and sometimes they will be, most of the time, they will be continuing the prescription, and we don't know when the husband comes back. And they may get, uh, become pregnant, and then, <laughs> and we will be coming, and we'll be coming to know about these things much later. And about the, I don't know whether there is a national pregnancy registry and uh, is there a, at least we we'll, the Indian Psychiatric Society should take initiative insisting on these uh, measures like uh, having a pregnancy registry. And there should be an even, a, all patients will be given an advanced warning about these things, about uh, having the, having a rational and a safe use of 
psychotropic medication during pregnancy at least and now we have uh, we are uh, running behind the schedule at least we have times for uh, two questions not a question of course um, you have done my job i wanted to congratulate sushi for insisting Raj Mohan, it was very comprehensive, very candid, excellent presentation. Uh, I, have, I have my own personal formulation. Trifluperacy, right? Nor triptyline, escitalopram, clonazepam, no lithium, and carbamazepine. With no I mean, this I have formulated going through all the literature. Finally, reached this. No, uh, you said that uh, it actually supports your evidence. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it was very well done. Um, at this stage, at least, I'm not sure whether I would stay back. If if I have my other colleagues to stay back, I would uh, very much wish. But then, uh, it is uh, really nice. The topics were very nice, but. Uh, I cross with you. We should have had ethics also. It would have been fantastic. A big hand for all uh, the organizers for this presentation. <laughs> of course, this should not uh, dissuade us from staying back. I would prefer when you, if you all stay back. Thank you. One more question. Endoxifin during pregnancy. Right? The problem is, endoxifin trials are there only in India. And the endoxifin trials are pretty naive. Is it a good mood stabilizer? That question actually needs to be answered. So I would say I'll rather stay away from endoxifin. And the interesting presentation there was that with the CYP2D6, you can't give an endoxifin with an with sertral. You're going to run into trouble. So why should we actually consider endoxifen currently? Even with more established drugs, we are having real trouble. And we are now going for a drug which is not even approved across the board, across countries. So this trial which actually lands up in court will be a trial for us. So uh, just a clarification. Yeah. Ours is a country, a state, where across the counter uh, administering uh, medication by the pharmacist is very, very common. So uh, while taking history, you should pursue to find out whether the person, the lady had any drugs or have been having. They may not disclose on their own. So while history taking, you have to take real effort to find out which are the medications and make a note of that because subsequently uh, Kerala people are very litigious uh, the, uh, especially these days not only litigious we have to be really we are re really at risk of getting bashed up these days uh, you know doctors being bashed up has become the order of the day these days is, you know so we have to be very careful we make a note of it whether the person had across the counter because I have seen myself in one of the pharmacy in Mauro Road when I went to buy a medication, a prescription is written and they conveniently wrote my name prescribed by whom that is across the counter. I have not seen, not seen, never seen that person. You know? My person, I was shocked. They did not know that this is the person and they wrote immediately uh, somebody coming from Nadaka means that that's, this was years ago. Now most of the people won't know my name also. Just to answer the question finally, endoxifen should not be used because it's a category D drug. Just to make a point clear, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Rajmohan wanted to avoid a very embarrassing situation. The scientific committee chairman doing a presentation. But I told him, it is the organizing committee chairman's decision. You, you have to do it. That's why he did it.
I think with that we can wind up the session. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to request uh, Dr. Nikhil Yu, sir, to hand over the memento to the speaker. They are classmates. And I would like to request Dr. Zoheb Saw to give a token of appreciation to the chairpersons. Now it's time for a half, uh, half an hour uh, lunch break. Kindly be back for the amazing session, post-lunch session.